welcome to the show with no no name and no point at this point. But we might potentially have a name. <laughs> we do. We are we are unmasked, maybe. So welcome uh, to unmasked. Welcome, welcome to the. But all the third videos may be in unmasked. the trenches. But no, we're, we're gonna have a series in the trenches. But right, we are the umbrella unmasked. Cool. If it doesn't sound good, let us know, and we'll change it to do whatever yes. you all want. If you guys want. hate it, we will adjust. <laughs> okay, so today we are unmasking me. Selena has been fully unmasked. Robbie, we understand all the all that is Robbie. I feel like I was unmasked hard. You were you were destroyed. <laughs> if I don't have haters, then I don't know what to say. You didn't do anything right then. <laughs> now it's for his turn. Okay. Are you ready for it? No, but let's go anyway. Nice. Let's yeah. start from the age where you had your first memory. For age what was your first, first memory? <laughs> okay, my first memory. I think there's there's two that happen very similar times. First one is very vague, but it's like my grandpa walking me to school. I think like pre-K or something. Um, but yeah, I don't remember much. I just know that I'm walking down some street and we're going to school and my grandpa's holding my hand and that's the end of the memory. That's that one. Where were the, you born? There's the what? Oh, sorry. Continue. Continue. So. Other than that, there's like two other ones. Again, I'm in pre-K. So I grew up in El Paso. Uh, but like, I was born in El Paso, but I grew up in Juarez, Mexico. And I didn't speak English for like the first five years of my life. But they put me, they, like, my family moved to El Paso when I was really young. And then they put me in pre-K, where everyone spoke English. And I didn't know what the heck this lady was saying. But she was talking gibberish to me, and I was in trouble. So I remember that. So you and started then, off in trouble. Yeah. Well, like, yeah, because I didn't know how to do anything. I was just like, I, apparently I was doing something wrong, and this lady did not like it, but I didn't know what the heck she was saying. So that's the first memory. And another memory that happened at a very similar time. I think I might have been like half a year, a year older than this. We were at lunch, and it was, like, this playground with, like, a sand pit, and there's, like, monkey bars on the top, and I was playing in the sand pit underneath the monkey bars, and there was a kid on top of me walking across, and he dropped his toy, and it was, like, I don't know, like, there was, like, a there's like the transformers and there's like the ghetto transformers, which is like, they transform into like animals and stuff. It was really popular when I was a kid. Robbie for sure has no idea what I'm talking about. Cause he doesn't know anything. Um, and Selena's from a different country. So I'm just talking to a wall right now, but there's this transformer thing that they turn into animals and they started making little figures. And I really liked those. And this kid was walking across and out of his pocket fell like, the water guy or what he turns into like a manta ray or something and if like i I watched it fall in slow motion right in front of me it falls kid does not notice kids goes on and he's having his his good life playing in the monkey bars and he runs off to go do something else and i look at it and i want it and i grab it i put it in my pocket and then i think i'm scot-free and then as we're leaving the playground, we all kind of get in line. And um, like the kid had told the teacher, hey, I'm missing my toy. I'm missing my toy. I'm missing my toy. And then they were like, hey, someone has this toy. Where's this toy? And then I didn't raise nothing. I don't, I don't want to raise my hand or anything. And I was just kind of hiding in my pocket. Like nothing's going on here. Um and they were like, we're not leaving this playground until we find this toy. If we need to search all of you, we will do that. And I was sweating bullets, but they were just like, they were just like messing with us. Like they weren't actually going to do that, but they were just kind of like threatening. And I still didn't raise my hand. I still didn't say anything. They didn't search us. I went on with my day. I had my toy. And I remember feeling like extreme guilt after this. This is like, one of my first memories is me stealing something. 
<laughs> so were you uh, five five and a half maybe um but yeah i remember i stole it and then i couldn't play with it i like i felt like somebody was watching over me somebody was going to recognize the toy and then i just couldn't enjoy it so i just like put it like the bottom of my like toy box and i never played with it but i just remember feeling super super guilty that i took this kid's toy and i didn't get any benefit out of it and that's that's like first two three memories nice and then how like how would you characterize the first let's say decade of your life like when you were a kid right you're three four five six seven eight nine right yeah like what what happened a lot happened (laughs) um so i started first grade well i I was i was in pre-k and then it was like like i don't know english i don't know anything I remember like doing like my letters, like A, whatever. Um, but yeah, I just remember I didn't really understand what anybody was saying. And I remember I was in trouble for that. Um, and then I started first grade. First grade was better because they put me in a, in a bilingual program. So like my teacher, like first, second, and third grade, I had the same teacher and it was all in Spanish with like sprinklings of English. Like they had like English lessons, but it was taught in Spanish. This was essentially an ESL program. Um, So I'm doing Spanish first grade. I do very well. Um, Like my my teacher thinks that like I'm smart or whatever. He's telling my mom that I'm smart. And then second grade, I do well. Third grade, I'm not I'm pretty sure I was with the same teacher. I think I remember being the same teacher, but it was also in Spanish. Fourth grade, it was English and Spanish half the time. And then I did well in that. And then fifth grade it was all English. So like the first like between five and ten, it was just like a transition of like trying to figure out how to learn this alien language. But I would still go home and everybody spoke English and I would go to school and everybody would speak. But sorry, at home, everybody spoke Spanish and then I would go to school and everybody spoke English. So like I'm native in both. I can't really, I struggle reading in Spanish, but like I can, I can speak to anyone in Spanish. I know Spanish. Um, and now I, I think and read and, and speak in English. And I'm curious, like, Tell me about like how you felt those years. I'm curious, like, okay, what's that, going through your head? Good, yeah, it's a good question. So, it is important to note this is a theme throughout all of life, even to today. I don't fit in general in almost all populations, but especially in El Paso, I don't fit. Uh, so I was always extremely different. It felt to me like I was extremely different from everybody. Even all my cousins, like even in my family, I don't fit. I was like a black sheep. Um, so I remember feeling like, why am I so freaking different from everybody? But it was very hard for me to make friends. It was very hard for me to like get along with anyone in my family. I never felt really close to any of my cousins or any of my, like my parents, my grandparents. Like it always felt like they were just thinking in a, in a very different way than me. So I felt really alienated my entire life. Do you have the answer now? Do you know why you're so different? And what's different about you? I I think when you're... I mean, I I think I understand what's different, but I think people are kind of born on a spectrum. And there's like some genetic abnormal... Like every everyone born has like some deviation. And I think I was just born on the far end of the spectrum somehow. Um, I think it might have been easier if I knew my dad, but I don't know my dad. But according to my mom and according to everybody who knew my dad, I'm a lot like my dad. But he was never around, so I didn't see that. I saw my mom, I saw my grandparents, I saw my cousins, and I'm nothing like any of them. But everyone what told traits? me I look... The what? Like what traits? The looks? Or like, you, you I look like my dad. I think like, I, I talk like my dad. And I look like my dad. Um, but yeah. And, and 
I think people would have characterized my dad as smart, charismatic, powerful. I don't think I'm powerful, but like he could take charge of any room from what I'm told. And he was kind of like a hustler. So in this dimension, like being charismatic, do you think you're similar to your dad in some way? Because you mentioned you're kind of like a black sheep. You don't fit in so much with the crowd. Yeah. Um, but he is like kind of a leader type. Yeah, I would say I never had the charismatic, really, growing up. I was like, didn't know how to talk to people, couldn't pick up social cues, could not get anyone to do anything that I wanted. I had no power at all in school. So like the charisma was definitely not there. I learned a few things later on. Like I, I spent a lot of time on the phones. I worked at a call center. So I picked up a lot of clues there of like how to talk on the phone, how to hold a conversation, how to talk to people. But yeah, I would say in no way was any of this natural to me. It was all a struggle from the get-go. So a lot of people would probably characterize themselves as different, right? I'm wondering, do you have any stories that kind of, I don't know, illustrate how different you were from your family and friends? Sure, many. <laughs> um, so for example, everyone in my family dances. You cannot find a Mexican in this world who doesn't dance, but I don't dance. Um, and that that's being facetious or whatever, but I, yeah, I, I have no rhythm. I couldn't, I had two left feet. I go to parties, everyone's dancing. I don't know what to do. I didn't dance. Uh, everyone in my family eats spicy food. So we're Mexican. Of course, you're going to eat spicy food. I don't. I was extremely picky with food growing up, which is not the case now. But like, I remember a story, like I, I went, we went to like a restaurant or something and it was like, like, they make sandwiches. Like that's like kind of like the thing. It's like a torta, which is like a Mexican sandwich. And uh, my mom asked me what I wanted, and I would pick, like, a ham one or something. And then the guy was like, is there anything you don't want on your torta? And he, I was like, okay, well, what's on it? And he's like, lettuce? And I said, no. I'm like, tomato? And I said, no. And cheese? And I said, no. And mayonnaise? And I said, no. And avocado? And I said, no. So he's like, okay, so you want bread and ham? And I was like, yes. Um, and I'm curious, what about mentally? Because I think some of these are some preferences. Yeah. That not spicy food. What about mentally? Like fitting in, feeling part of it. Sure. Or... Yeah, yeah. So this is this is also pretty huge. Um, so for example, I grew up Catholic. Everyone in my family is Catholic across the board. There's not a single person who's not Catholic. Um, and I remember we would go to church when I was a kid, and I'm sitting there. And the guy's giving me his spiel or whatever. And I'm just thinking, like, this doesn't feel very true to me. Like, how do they know? Like, I think this is like a trait that I've had, like, my entire life. I always ask why. And then I figure that out. And then I ask why. And then I figure that out. And I ask why. And I go all the way down to can go no further. That's just been, like, a thing that I do. No one taught me that. It's just me. Um, so I remember being in church and I'm asking why and it didn't really make sense then I go ask people I ask my mom I ask whoever like people around me and they give me their answer and then as I start digging I eventually reach well you just got to have faith like you just have to believe I'm like that that's not an answer like what, what the heck does that mean like if you go by that logic anything you want to be true could be true so I remember every all my cousins everyone around me they're all they're all praying every day. They're all going to bed, reading all the things, reading the Bible, whatever. And I'm just like, this makes no sense. Like, that, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. And I ask, he's got to have faith. I'm like, that's ridiculous. Like, how can anyone live their life that way? Or he's going to get some haters. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so how did you react to that situation where you're different? Do you try? Did you try to fit in or pretend to be like them? Or did you try to like change them? What was your, how did you cope with that? Yeah, there was no trying to fit in, I would say. Um, I tried to make friends, 
And in some things I could, like if you play like a similar sport or something, or if you were in like gym class or like I was good at math, maybe I would find someone who was also good at math. But yeah, like for the most part, I was not very successful at making friends. And I was always very alienated, left out, and not a part of the group at home and at school. And how did this impact your relationship with your family when you were growing up? What was that like? Yeah. So I would say I am not very close to almost all of them because I felt like we were just on different wavelengths. There was nothing that we had in common. There was nothing that we could talk about that we had in common. Like they saw the world one way and I saw the world a different way. And those two worlds were never going to fit. So, um, we're going to get to my mom, but my mom didn't get along for most of my life. My grandparents went to like first and third grade. So there was no, like, I really wanted to have like deep intellectual philosophical conversations and there was no one anywhere in my radar that wanted to have that conversation. So I wasn't really super close to my family, not super close to my cousins. Like when we were kids, we were kind of close because we would play. But, like, as soon as I could think, like, they just, they went on and lived their normal lives, and I was just left alone in my room. At what so, age did you start thinking? Like, deeply? Ten? Not six months, I'm sorry. I'm slow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I was just going to say, so Selena learned thinking at six months, you at ten, and me at, like... 24. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious, like, so no close relationship with family, um, mm -hmm. not really a close friend. Um, at what age did you first have a close interpersonal relationship, like any type of any? Well, there was there was a couple that were kind of close, but I don't really talk to any of those people anymore. But there was a guy, there was a neighbor on my street who we always played basketball together. So I probably played with him basketball and like a couple other neighbors. We probably played every day for like three, four years between like the ages of like, I don't know, like 10 and 14, something like that. Maybe the beginning of high school. Yeah. Um, so like we literally, I would go, we play basketball all day and come home, but like no talking. It was just, we're playing basketball. Um, and then in high school, I made another friend in band because I was in band. Uh, I had a, what I would have called with then my best friend. Um, we were both in the trombone section. We both played trombone. He just kind of happened to sit next to each other. He loved playing video games. I loved playing video games. We played video games. He was pretty smart. He liked having long, like, philosophical conversations. I would say not as much as me, but he would entertain them. Like he, he cared way more about like being an athlete or dating or like he, he had his own life, but he, when he was with me, he would entertain like these long, deep conversations. And that was pretty fun for me. And he also had like a lot of mental issues. So I was kind of like his, his rock, I guess. He was always like having a lot of issues at home. He, dated not very stable women and like things would always kind of fall apart for him and when things would fall apart i was kind of always there to kind of put the pieces back together and kind of try to help him put his life back together so we so he was he was a very good friend for me and i still kind of talk to him like once or twice a year so let's go back to the age 10 okay. at this time range my interpretation right now is that you're developing individual thought a little bit more. You're questioning things. And this is leading to some family and friends being like, that's kind of weird. Like, no one asks why God did this thing, right? Yeah. Uh, Etc. Yeah. So that's, I think, like, I'm interested in your mental state, right? So mentally, from like the, let's just say the thought process, you were very intellectual. How about from the emotional side? What was the, what were like the emotional feelings side of zero to 10? Yeah. So I, I grew up in a very turbulent household. 
So emotions were very extreme and always, I would say. My mom being pissed was like a daily occurrence. Shouting was pretty common. Uh, my grandma getting angry at my grandpa, my mom and my grandma fighting, me and my mom fighting, like my my aunt and, and my mom fighting, like literally just fights constantly over anything. Like you say anything, chair gets set and then it's just downhill from there. So constant screaming, constant arguing. Um, and... Me and my mom actually have the same, like, coping mechanism. We kind of explode, and then we kind of leave the situation, lock the door, cool off, and come back, and I like nothing happened. <laughs> Which is completely alien to Rob. He knows no conflict. Yeah. Yeah, like, I, this, this world of no conflict, I would love to know it, because I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, what are your parents like? Oh, that's a, that's a whole can of worms. <laughs> There's a lot there. Uh, I'll try to, I'll try to summarize some of the major events. But so my dad's easy because I don't have a dad from my perspective. Um, yeah, like, yeah, like my my parents got divorced when I was when my wife, my mom was pregnant, and I didn't really meet my dad till I was like five, and I kind of, I remember I think I seen him twice in my life. Um. The first time I think I was five, and I don't really remember much. I think he took us to eat at some like Mexican restaurant, you know, like pre- pretty famous Mexican restaurant in Juarez. And the second time, I think he came over for Christmas. I know my dad has like a lot of other children with other women, so I have like eleven half brothers or something like that. I don't know any of them, um, but yeah, my dad's crazy. I don't know much about him. I met him once when I was five. I saw him against when I was eight. I think he bought me a chess set, and that, that's all. That's that's the beginning, middle, and end of the dad. So that one's easy. <laughs> um, my mom is, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot there. <laughs> I probably need to go, like, years of therapy for this one. Um, but, yeah, so pretty much my mom and, all, and I have always had pretty, pretty rough relationship. Um, yeah, uh, so my mom, I'm trying to, like, I'm trying to be kind here, because, like, if my mom sees this, she's gonna, like, cry, like, go too hard, <laughs> uh, but I think, I, I still think I should, like, I should preface this, that I love my mom, but mom, I love you, okay, you're okay, <laughs> just a lot, a lot happened, um, so, yeah, like, I, I remember my childhood with, like, my mom being angry. <laughs> a lot at everyone and it felt very unfair to me how she treated the entire family uh so i i lived with my mom and my grandparents in the same house in el paso and i remember feeling like like no one could stand up to my mom like my my grandpa was just like stay quiet and like take whatever my mom would say uh because i think he was like afraid of her and my grandma again would just like just pretty much agree with anything my mom said and i would get very aggressive with my mom because i felt that what she was doing was not okay like the way she would talk to people the way she would treat people like just like yeah and um there was nothing that you could say to her that could even point at the idea that she might be doing something wrong like if you say no, no matter how you say it like even if you're saying it kindly most of, most of the time people were not saying it kindly but if you point out a flaw that my mom did this my mom did that she would react with just immediate anger and just throw everything at you <laughs> um yeah so like any anything would just get judoed right back to you and then you're the problem but yeah like we just and to be fair, I think this is like, I'm sure some really, really traumatic stuff happened to my mom, which I do not know about. She has not told me about, but I'm sure a lot happened to my mom for her to be that way. Um, 
But yeah, like my mom had like zero emotional regulation, zero ability to, um, yeah, just like take any form of criticism. So the moment that criticism was pointed out, it would just, it would just be a storm of anger thrown at you. Um, and everyone knew this, like my grandparents knew this, so they wouldn't say anything. I cared a lot about the unfairness of this. So I would stand up to her a lot and I kind of build up a pretty tough skin, I think because of this, because like she would just like go off on me and I would go off on her. Um, but yeah, like a lot of stuff happened that I thought was pretty unfair. Like for example, my mom was a shopaholic. I'm not sure if she would agree with that. She would probably say she's not like hundred percent. She is. Um, so we were pretty poor. But, like, when I would, like, sit down and do the math, it didn't make sense that we were so poor. It didn't make sense that, like, like if I would add up, like, I, I would try to do this. I would try to add up every single bill that we had, and I would try to add, a, like, well, how, how much do you make, and how much do you owe, and all this stuff. And I would do the math, and it would never add up. Like, we always were above our expenses, but we were always broke. It never made sense to me. Um, and, uh, the act of asking these questions, since my mom was lying about how much she was spending, would piss her off. So she would go off on you and she would get angry and she'd slam doors and just like, yeah, like even the mentioning of like, can I know how much you make? Can I know how much you owe? Immediate fight automatically. Um, yes, yeah, so we fought a lot about money. Um, and how old were you when you did those math? I was probably late middle school and all of high school I did this. All of high school was just constant money fights. That's why I started working so young. I started working at 16 because, like, we were always poor. Um, I kind of started, like, figuring things out that things didn't make sense. But, like, I, I kind of grew up in the culture, like, your family needs money, you get a job, you work. So. I wanted to help my family. I was like, okay, if I make money, you won't be broke anymore. So I'm going to go get a job and work my ass off and get as much money as I can. I made the unfortunate mistake of sharing a bank account with my mom, which I now know you never, ever, for any reason do. No matter what happens, you never do this. <laughs> because my experience was money would come in, my mom would see it, money would leave, and I would never see it again. I don't know why it was being like she she would always say that she needs it for this or she needs it for that. And then like I would still see like shoes and purses being bought, but we're not any less broke. No matter how hard I worked, we were never any less broke. We were always equally screwed, no matter what happened. No matter how much income was coming in, we were always the exact same level of broke. What did you do in the end? Did you close the account or stop putting money in there? Yeah, so that, that happened for a couple years before I caught on. Um, because I, I really didn't know. Like, I thought, I thought the money was being used for, like, to help us. But I think it was just, I think how it was really going on is my mom would have money. My mom would buy things. Then she wouldn't have money. And then she would that kind of expect me to fill in the gap that she created at the beginning of the month. If that makes sense. So my mom, let's say my mom gets paid. She, for whatever reason, emotional, whatever going on, like her vice was, was shopping. So I think my mom would go when she would get paid and pay off whatever she needed to pay off. Like immediately, whatever was left was going to get spent. She wasn't thinking like, okay, I have this much left. And I have this bill coming up, and I need to pay that, so I should save this. Like, I don't think that was happening. I think she would pay off whatever needed to be paid off immediately. Whatever was left would get spent, knowing that my check is going to come in, and that's going to be there. So, she, like, her reasoning would always, like, oh, I need it for gas. Oh, I need it for rent. Oh, I need it for this. But the reason she needs it for gas and she needs it for rent is because she bought stuff during the month. How sense. did she pay for your school? She didn't pay for my school. Who paid it? 
Uh, what school needed like to be paid? Elementary <laughs> school, middle school, high school. Were they all free? Yeah, it's all public school. Mm. So, like, is that is that not the case in China? Do you have to pay for? No, no, you have to pay even if it's public. really mm-hmm. like very minimal, I think. But still, you pay. No, At least you need we, to pay for the books. Yeah, I think we paid for like supplies and we paid for like uniform, but it wasn't much. Like, but like if there was like an extracurricular or an activity, like I wasn't like a lot of times I couldn't join because we didn't have money. Were there any private schools in El Paso that you could have gone? I'm to? sure, but my family could never afford any of them. I know that I know I had some friends like when they graduated middle school, they went to like private Catholic schools, but I don't think I would ever go to a private Catholic school. And even if they could afford it, and my family could never afford that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you but closer- that, mm-hmm. yeah, so yeah, it was all, all public school. You don't have to pay anything. It, it gets paid by property taxes here in the U.S. Um, but uh, yeah, so um. I wouldn't call my mom a compulsive liar, but there was a lot of lies. <laughs> uh about like like I think a compulsive liar just lies to lie. Like my mom would lie, but she would lie about the things that she did that she didn't want you to know about. So I think she was always like misspending money. I don't know if she felt guilty or I don't know I don't know what happened, but she yeah. It's like I would ask her well, what happened to this or what happened to that, and my mom would just lie. And I know she was lying. And if I say she's lying, then she would blow up. And yeah, it was just downhill from there. So you closed the account when you after were after a working? couple of years. No, I, I, yeah, like years later, I closed the account. I, I didn't catch on for a while. Like I thought I was being a good son, just helping his family make it, but that's not what was happening. And what happened afterwards in your relationship um, there? Um, well, like she was really pissed that I did that. And like my mom would do this thing, which I freaking hated. Um, yeah, so many things with my mom. Um, my mom would, I would say, bend the truth when she was telling a story. And I would like, I I get very upset about non-truth, you know? (laughs) So like, let's say a couple things happened in an argument. My mom would go to my grandma and maybe say things that are true, but are not representative of what happened. It would be like, he's angry at me for no reason or something. She might say something like that. Or like, I did this one little thing and now he's like screaming at me or something like that. Like This would be like a story my mom would say. And then my grandma would hear that and she'd be like all against me. And I'm like, whoa, 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 hold on. That, that is not what went down. Do you want to hear the actual story? And then I would tell the actual story, and then my mom, my grandma would kind of be in the middle. But no matter what, like my, my grandma never caught on to this. Like no matter what story my mom told her at the beginning, that was true until I corrected. And I'm like, when are you gonna like catch on that this woman just lies? Like it's just not happening. But it just it just never happened. So usually, me and my mom would fight. My mom would go to my grandma, and they would both come at me because I was being a bad son. What was your relationship like with your grandparents? Um, my grandpa was cool. It was all right. Um, we didn't do much. We played basketball for a little bit. We played, but he was kind of old. We played. He taught me how to play cards. But my my grandpa just watched TV all day. He just watched soccer all day long. Um, my grandma was like hardworking, just like typical Mexican grandma. Just worked all day, cooking, cleaning. Uh, did way too much for me, which like when I got when I left the house, I had like no skills, which was pretty bad. <laughs> but yeah, she kind of like babied me a lot, like just pretty much did everything for me. But, you know, my relationship with my grandma was really good, except like when my mom would be involved. Um, but like some other stuff that happened with my mom, she pawned my car. <laughs> I don't know if you know this story, Selena, Mm-mm. but um, I was I was eating cereal. Um, I was, I, I had like, I had bought my own car with my own money. Like I, I had like sold candy at the school. Like I would go to Juarez, I would buy candy. I would come back to to school and sell them in class in high school. And I saved up enough money to like, I like, I saved up like $2,000 and I bought my first piece of junk car, <laughs> like absolute trash. Um, 
And so I bought, it was a green Buick Skylark, just horrible, horrible green, ugly color. But I bought my car. Um, and I'm eating cereal. I'm looking out the window. It's like a Saturday. And then someone starts stealing my car. Like out of nowhere. Like some dude just starts stealing my car. And I go out there and I start fighting with the guy. Like, hey, what the heck are you doing? And he's like, hey, it's not my fault you didn't pay. And I was like, didn't pay who? Like, what What do you mean? I didn't, like, he was like, you didn't pay. And I called my mom. and was like, they're stealing the car. And they're saying that we, I didn't pay. Like, what, what, what didn't I pay? And she's like, hold on. Just like, make them stay there for 10 minutes. I'll talk to them or whatever. So my mom, like, rushes in. She talks to the guy. I don't know how she arranged it so that I could keep my car, but I kept my car. And that's how I found out that she had stolen my, my, like, well, it's not stolen. I guess she was keeping it because she kept all my records. That she had taken the title to my car and she had taken it to like a fast money place and she had pawned it. And I guess she couldn't make the payments. So they were repossessing the car. But then you kept it? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what arrangements she made so that I could keep the car. But like, yeah, I think she made a payment or something. But I, I could keep the car. But I was so livid after that. I was like, I didn't even want to talk to her. And like at that at that moment, I was like, you're not touching any of my stuff. You know, I don't, I don't care what document I have, my birth certificate, whatever. Give it to me. Like get get out of my stuff. Um. So that was the car. She destroyed my credit <laughs> which was pretty bad um yeah so like my mom has like a bad history with credit cards a bad history with credit in general my mom kind of destroys any credit that she goes near she destroyed my grandpa's credit she destroyed my grandma's credit she destroyed my credit and she destroyed her credit like all four for four everyone in the house my mom took them all out um uh yeah so she would uh she would say something like like I turned like 18. I was like in college, community college. And she was like, um, uh, can you open this card for me? And it was like a Macy's card, a Victoria's Secret card or something. And I'd be like, no, I don't want a credit card. And then she'd be like, it, it was like a couple of different arguments, but she's like, you don't understand how the world works. If you don't have credit, then no one's going to let you borrow money. Like, you're not going to be able to buy a car. You're not going to be able to buy a house. If you don't have credit, you're nothing or something like that. So that was one of the arguments. And another argument was like, you're my only son and you can't do this one thing for me. Like, all I'm asking for is one credit card and you won't get it for me. And then she would go to my grandma and she'd say, like, my only son is not getting me a credit card. And then they would both come into my room and start screaming at me that I'm not such a bad son for not getting her a credit card. So I would cave and I got her a credit card. And then a couple months later, she'd do it again. So, like, she ended up getting, like, three or four credit cards. That's that's going on in the background. I don't know what's going on. Like, she says she's paying them or whatever. No one's calling me or anything. And then suddenly I start getting calls that like I'm in collections or something and that I I find out that she's not, she's not making the payments. I'm like behind on everything. And I have like a 500 credit score. Like, I don't know if you know what that means, but like, you're pretty much at zero in the U S how do you get it back up? I mean, now you're like, a Oh man, it was a whole thing. Expert. Yeah. It was, it was miserable. Um, yeah. So in, in the end, I like, I like negotiated with collections. I don't know what I was doing. So I did everything wrong. Like everything stayed, I paid and everything stayed on my record. It was so bad. Like if I were to do this again, I would have done it so differently, but I didn't know what I was doing. Um, but yeah, so I, I like called the collection people and then I paid them off. And then they said that everything was in good standing, but the collection was going to stay on my record for seven years. So my rec, my credit was like, in the garbage can for seven years and i ended up paying like i owed like probably like i don't know 10 12k and i was like i was like a poor college student like working at a call center and i had to pay like i don't know like five six k to get it off um yeah i was so pissed with her after that. so pissed <laughs> um so the credit the car the inaccurate stories yeah we had like an absolute just horrible relationship for most of my life 
Uh, oh, this is another thing that would like drive me crazy. Like I would, I would try to like do something like fix things in our household because everything was always falling apart. We were always in like money trouble. And like one of the things was that like she she would involve everyone else in the family, like all my cousins and aunts and stuff. And it was always like our account that was like in charge of everything. Like let's say a phone bill or something. Like you save money if everybody gets the same phone plan, like with AT and T or something. So they would make this like thing, like okay, well like let's all get under one plan, and then that'll be cheaper for everybody. But it was under my mom's name or my grandpa's name or something. And like, if we don't pay, like, it, like let's say like my cousin couldn't pay or my aunt couldn't pay, or what, which happened all the time, then we would have to end up paying because we're going to lose our phone service for that. So we always, and I felt like we always ended up paying more than, than I was like, I don't care if she's a sister. I don't care if they're, I, I don't care if they're my cousins, like take them off the plan. Like, this is ridiculous. And she would never listen to me, and she didn't listen to me for years. And then, like, many, many years later, she realized what I was saying, and then she, like, she acted like she came up with the idea of taking them off the phone plan. Like, like no one had ever mentioned this. It was all her, came out of just her mind, that, yeah, maybe it's not such a good idea to have them on the phone plan, so I took them off. And I was like... I literally been saying this every couple months for like the last six years. What are you talking about? Um, so yeah, that would drive me crazy. Um, yeah. So I, I would say that like, I legitimately like hated my mom for like most of high school. Um, and we like, there was, we almost came to the point where like, I was like, I don't even have a mom. Like, I don't even need you in my life. Like, yeah, I don't, yeah, you just you just make my life worse. And I I was very close to just like not talking to her. And this was like right after my son was born. And I don't know what happened. I don't know what she did. But I think like maybe she realized that if she didn't change the way she was acting, like she wasn't gonna have a relationship with my grandson, uh, with her grandson. And she like changed like dramatically, like overnight, like she was like a different person. She started accepting a lot of things that I was saying. She started apologizing for a lot of things that she did. I started understanding more what was going on. Like we, we finally had the conversations that I had been trying to have for like like my whole childhood. Like they finally started happening and we started kind of understanding each side, like each other's side a little bit more. So now our relationship's okay. Like now we're good. But yeah, that could have that could have gone south many times. And so how did this affect you? Like either at the time or moving forward? Yeah, I would say I had very bad emotional regulation. And I would say it still affects me today. Um where like if something bothers me, like it's very hard for me to control my emotions. I would say the list of things that bothers me now is really small. But if something bothers me, it's like I can't do anything about it. Um, What's still on your list? Someone saying something that's not true <laughs> is definitely on the list. <laughs> I care a ridiculous amount about truth. If I have a god about anything, it's it's truth. Truth is my religion. Okay. Any stories before we move from ten to like I think middle school is next. Is there anything on zero to 10 that you feel like influenced your life and made you kind of who you are today? So we talked about religion. We talked about my mom, like, like the the general, everyone's kind of fighting all the time. Talked about, I don't really fit in, in like most situations. Uh, Okay. This this is actually kind of huge because I don't want to hate on my family too much. the one thing that they did amazingly well, and like, like you cannot put a price tag on this, I had endless love. Like, there's not a thing on this world that I can do that would make my mom not love me or my grandparents. Like, I was literally, it was literally impossible. I could murder people and they would still love me, which is crazy to me. Um, but yeah, like, just endless amount of love. And how and, is that? And, how is that? Ex- how was that communicated or expressed? Just physical touch was a lot. Um, 
like I could see that in their eyes, like, like it just felt like there was nothing that I could do that would make them stay angry with me or make, like not to do anything for me. Cause like my parents sacrificed a lot. Like they left their family, they left their home in, in, in Juarez to come to El Paso. And that was like a big thing. And they did all of that just so that I could go to school in the United States so that I could speak English so I could have a better life. So they like, there's nothing that they would, they wouldn't do for me, which is huge. However, they had no emotional regulation and they really didn't have any tools of how to think or how to approach life. So that kind of came out. But as far as them loving their kids, infinite. They'll do anything. Um, two fun. other things that I think are pretty That's important. That's really interesting. Look at Selena's point before we move on. Hmm? Uh, so the three of us have a lot in common. Like you and I, we, both, we have kind of similar like family situations. My grandparents would fight. My parents would fight. My grandpa would fight with my dad. It's just like a... Um, <laughs> and I would fight with people. I mean, well, not people. I would fight with my dad. Um, and we also do the cool down, lock door, calm down. <laughs> and then... So even I would fight with my grandma. And then I would just like lock myself in the room and then come out after <laughs> I, uh, 30 minutes or so. I would be like, I'm sorry. I'm wrong. I would never do it again. <laughs> yeah, that, this is. I think this pattern is really common, of... actually, in our in our communities, mm -hmm. like the like the poor community. And I think one interesting thing that I notice between all three of us is that all of us, our families gave us like what you would call unconditional love, sacrifice, yeah. and sacrifice. So that's yeah. interesting. That like that that's a big thing, and all of us had that. Yeah. And it's not a common thing. Some people don't do that. Yeah, no, yeah. Like, I, as much as I, like, say, like, the my fire messed up a lot, like, they got probably the most important thing, right? Yeah. You said there was two more things, so I'll let you yeah, finish that up. I'm trying to remember what they are. So, uh, another thing that I still think, like, severely affects me today, which is not really their fault, it's just the culture, but just, like, infinite sugar always and forever um i was actually very skinny when i was a kid i was one of like the fastest people like in first second third grade you can count my ribs um so like like i remember my coaches were like oh he could be a runner i was tall i was lanky so i was fast so like i thought i was gonna be like some kind of athlete because i was i liked playing sports um, but at one point we went to like the doctor and the doctor was like, yeah, he's too skinny. He needs to put on some weight. My grandma heard that. And she was like, all the calories going down this dude. So mm -hmm. like, she would like force me to eat and just like constantly give me extra food and like infinite sugar. And like, I was, I blew, like you could see in my pictures when I, I was really, really skinny and then I was huge <laughs> and I stayed that way. <laughs> um, so that was like a big thing. Um, there was one more thing. Uh, so there's this, there's this like dynamic where like, this is like mainly like an El Paso thing, but a lot of people will like work and live and go to school out of El Paso, but you don't live there. You lived in Juarez. So it's very common for people to like cross the border in El Paso, like from Juarez to El Paso, which takes like, Depending on the day, an hour, hour and a half, two hours, three hours, just you just really don't know. So you have to like wake up like at three, four in the morning, get all your kids ready, put them in the car, drive across the border. And yeah, so we did that for a while. And then we bought a house here, but all my cousins were still doing that. So all my cousins were driving across the border every day for years. And then they would come to my house and then we would all go to the school together. Um, but yeah, like, and I spent every weekend in Juarez. So Monday through Friday was in English at school and Spanish at home. And then on the weekends, we go to Juarez, uh, and I, I spend the whole weekend there in Juarez with my grandparents. Um, and Juarez and El Paso are very, very different. Like, uh, Juarez is one of like the most dangerous cities in the world. Well, it was what's the time, 
and El Paso is one of the safest cities in the U.S. So like there's just like this huge like contrast between the two cities. Like I remember like the poverty in Juarez was crazy. Like every time you're crossing the border, you see people with like with no arms, holding babies, like everyone's selling candy and and all these things. Like I just like a ridiculous amount of poverty, which was crazy. Um, and I remember like I would hear gunshots when I was a kid every now and then. Nothing, nothing crazy. I never saw anyone die or anything, but it was just you could feel the difference. Like I didn't really see many homeless people in El Paso, but like you go across the border and there's all these everyone's poor. And everyone's struggling, and yeah, it was just it was just kind of crazy for me to see that when I was a kid. Where did your family stand socioeconomically? In these My two family, I would say, I'm trying to figure that out actually. So we were definitely poor. We we probably grew up. Everyone in my household, four people, on probably thirty five to forty thousand dollars a year. And yeah, so I was definitely poor. I remember going to school. My my mom's car was worse than everyone else's. I felt like we were always kind of missing rent or getting internet cut off or getting electricity cut off. Sometimes we couldn't. It didn't happen often, but sometimes like we wouldn't have money for food. Um, restaurants were very rare. No vacations at all. Um, but it was weird because. In our family, like my my grandma had three daughters, so it was like three groups of families that were all kind of connected. Out of those three, we were the richest, and we were making like thirty five grand, but we're somehow the richest. Um, so it felt to me like all the problems always kind of ended up in my house. My aunt can't pay rent; they come to us. My other aunt can't pay, gets losing the house. They come to us. Transmission went out. They come to us. And like, dude, we don't have money. But like the problem would always end up with like my my grandma would have to find a way to kind of save the day by calling some rich cousin or so like doing this over there, making some agreement with the neighbor or something. Like we were always problem solving everyone else's problems. Makes sense. So I think that's a good zero to 10 childhood. I think now let's go to middle school. Middle school. Okay. And so what happened in middle school? So middle school was rough for me because in elementary school, I was definitely different, but like I could like play like basketball or, or something in the mornings, but the, the gap between me and everyone else was getting bigger year by year. And I remember in middle school, I had like no friends. <laughs> I, I could not make a friend to save my life. Um, I'm very lucky that I wasn't like bullied, bullied, but like, I'm sure everybody was talking behind my back. Like, like, cause I couldn't dress. I couldn't do my hair. I couldn't, yeah, I, just, I had no social ability. I couldn't talk, couldn't do anything. Um, so yeah, like the middle schools were were lonely, were lonely years. Um, I was definitely good at math. I was definitely bad at English, like like all, any of the language. I was horrible at art. Um, but yeah, like the sciences, my love for the sciences definitely kind of grew in middle school. Um, I remember I tried to join the basketball team because I played a lot of basketball, but I was too scared to go to the tryouts. So I never joined the team just because I was too scared to go. Um, and my mom forced me to be in band and I really didn't want to go. And I wanted, and then she's like, no, you're going. Like, okay, I'm going. And then they kind of tried us out for different instruments and I wanted to be a drummer, but I'm a Mexican with no rhythm. So I couldn't be a drummer. Like, I remember she gave me a test and I messed that up so bad. And she was like, yeah, you're not a drummer. Um, so then I wanted to be a trumpeteer, but my lips were too big. So I couldn't be a trumpeteer. And then I ended up being a trombone player and I freaking hated it, hated that trombone. And then I had to go and tell my mom that we needed to buy one. 
and it was her idea to put me in band and I didn't know how expensive those things were, but they were like hundreds of dollars. And that was a lot for us. So we bought a trombone and I had to carry it every day from school and carrying an instrument home in El Paso. One, it's freaking hot. And two, everyone knows you're in band. So like, you're not cool in any way. <laughs> so yeah, just no friends. No dates. Didn't take anyone to any dances. When I would go to the dances, I couldn't, I couldn't dance. Yeah. So essentially, middle school. I'm weird. I'm different. No friends. I like math. Did you continue to explore your philosophical thoughts? Well, that was always happening. I can't turn my brain off. So like, I'm always thinking. And I'm always questioning. And I'm always going as deep as I possibly can until I understand. But like, that's not effort. It is just the way my brain works. Did you realize that it's called philosophy or it just naturally happened? Did you oh, I had no idea what the heck philosophy blogs? was. No, I, I, to me, it was just natural. Like, I, it was very weird to me to see that in other people's minds, they don't question. They just follow. And it's, it was shocking to me. Like, you really just go through life and you've never asked this question. I ask, I ask this question every day. Like, how do you do that? How do you live life this way? Really. And oh yeah, this is a similar question, but I'm wondering, like, at this time period, what do you think about yourself? Interesting. Uh, so I would say that I de that I developed a coping mechanism in middle school, and the coping mechanism was, I am not popular, I am not cool, I cannot get a girlfriend, but I'm smart. But I am this, but I'm that. So like, I'm always like balancing out my lack of ability in life. So, and I think that was just out of like, like, I don't know, desperation or need or something, but I still do it. Like, I'll like something bad will happen, but I'm like, okay, but this good thing happened. So like, I, I think, I, I think like everyone has to be like, be able to look themselves in the mirror and not hate themselves or else you kill yourself so i think like all the negativity kind of forced me to kind of look at some positive are you overall an optimist the way that i look at myself yes but if you tell me to analyze a situation i will look at it objectively but like the general vibe that i like of how i perceive myself is positive but if you point something out, and I'll be like, no, that's true. Yeah. Like, like the rosy colored glasses that I have off will come off anytime that I have to like see something objectively. And at this time, did you know what you wanted to do? No did clue. you know what you were interested in? Do you think Zero. about that? Nothing at all. Um, and it's important to note that no one in my life has like a career. Like there's, it was like my grand, my, my uncle who like made the most money has like two jobs. One is like, um, he like, he works at a factory and he like, he has a second job where he's like, he works for UPS or something like that. He was the successful one. He's the one that had the most money and everyone else has had like these dead end jobs where like, cause no one speaks English, no one's educated. So I didn't really have a roadmap of like, Oh, you're going to go and pick a career to to do for the rest of your life for me it was just like you go to school and eventually you work and then you just make ends meet somehow so like this idea of career was alien to me okay so middle school i feel like my current understanding is it was influenced by like you felt poor or mm -hmm. the mindset the lifestyle was more lower class. Mm, the, absolutely. the like social status was low. Mm. The fitting in was no was not good. The mental side on the like thought, you were very much like, yeah, I'm still thinking, I'm understanding, I'm learning. Like I'm, I'm guessing we're still learning. Mm. And then like on the emotional side, was it still kind of like a lot of up and downs, kind of emotion, but overall optimistic about yourself? Is that a good summary? Yeah. And um I didn't have a lot of opportunities to train socially. 
because like my default was like i'm just gonna go to my room and play video games and be by myself yeah so i want to bring this up when we get into like college because i noticed this about you in college and i'll tell you what i noticed but when we get there cool so let's go to high school so you transitioned from middle school to high school Mm -hmm. was this a big shift in your life was it more of the same more of the same slightly different um one thing that i i left out i was very good at band Mm -hmm. um so like i remember i was like all region like i was like i was like the best in best in the region best is something but like best trombone in the region and best trombone jazz band i love jazz band so this was kind of part of my balancing yes i'm unpopular yes but at least i'm the best at trombone or something Mm -hmm. um so i went to i went to high school and i was very very pumped about being in band in high school because i had like i was good and they had sent me there to do like a trial uh like one week there and they got me like my own special trombone because like they they needed someone to be a bass trombonist and i was one of the best in middle school so they got me my own special trombone and they were very excited to get me and they they sent me up there for a week uh and i remember like uh i don't know are either of you guys ever in band or no. orchestra or anything like that um i remember in middle school everyone at the beginning of the day you tune your instruments and then like like the instructor kind of gets everyone to play like an e or something right and we had done this every day for years and i i went to high school for that week and then we went to this room and then they do everyone tunes their instruments and they 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 do like a balance check and it it was so in tune i had never heard that I had no idea that we were so out of tune in middle school, but it, this was like, holy crap. Like this is heaven here. <laughs> uh, so I, I was super excited about going to band because like, I was like, oh man, everyone's better. I'm going to get better. I'm going to go be, I'm going to play trombone for the rest of my life. If, like if there was anything that I want to do career wise, I was like, I want to play trombone. Um, so I go to high school. And I get smacked in the mouth so hard in band because um, I didn't know this, but I wanted to play jazz band. My high school didn't have jazz band. So jazz was immediately out. One of the loves of my life, gone. Just forever. Um, so no jazz. And I, I didn't know this either. In high school, everyone in band has to march. So you have to wake up. At like 5 30 in the morning and you go to the football field and everyone's out there in the cold and everyone has to memorize all these like patterns and instructions and steps and you have to walk like the military and you have to land on this particular spot right on time and i sucked at this so bad i had no coordination i had no rhythm i had nothing new. um so yeah, it was very hard for me to play and walk at the same time. I had like spent all this time learning how to play sitting down and then suddenly like, they were like, okay, like jog now and play at the same time. And I was like, I don't want to jog. Like I'm, I'm like, put me in a room and I'll play. Like that's what I want to do. Why am I out here in the cold at five thirty? This is ridiculous. Um, but yeah, so like this killed any, any love I had for music immediately like that was i was in band in high school for like two years and i hated every second of it um yeah because like all you could hear um at this time i'm being called george because it was hard for people to pronounce my name so i like i'm being called george in high school and every day all you could hear george george you're over here George, you're offline. Like, I was just constant getting bashed every single day. I sucked. So, even in band with the uncool people, I was alienated. I was alone, even with the, I wasn't even cool enough for the uncools. (laughs) 
Like the band had cool people and I couldn't talk to them. I couldn't hang out with them. I was just a nobody. Dude, I was nothing, dude. Absolute in the trash in high school. Like, like the takeaway from there is that like I had like zero social status. Um, and I, I, again, not bullied. Nobody was beating me up in the lockers or anything, but just, I just felt like I could not do anything right. Like if I tried to be cool, if I, I, there was nothing I could say, I couldn't say things right. I couldn't understand. I couldn't pick up on stuff. Like, yeah, I just, yeah. Remember, I was trying at this point. So here's my comment. Here's my Mm -hmm. comment. And I I, I don't, this is like an analysis mode. When I first met you, I could tell that you weren't unable to understand social cues. This is like 10 years later. Yeah. yeah. Right. And I don't, it's very interesting. Like, what is it? Is this a lack of reps? Is this a common thing? Is it not common? It was, it was very clear. Yeah, yeah. He seems fine now, right? But I'm just saying that when I first yeah. met him in 2016, it was a, it, it was a, it was a clear thing that I could see. Yeah, yeah. No, I, absolutely. And when you met me in 2016, that was significantly improved from high school. Right. So I can imagine the situation. It was bad, dude. Like and real, I think real bad. My this is my assumption. There's a part of your brain. That was like it. You can't empathize, right? This is like this weird irony thing. Mm. But somehow, you can't understand how your actions will be perceived by somebody else. Is that Mm -hmm. true? I, I'm better now. Significantly better. Still, there's a gap there. But when Rob met me, I had no idea. Slight idea, and in high school, zero idea. I had no clue. I thought, oh, they're doing this, so I'm going to do this. But I don't know how it looks like when I do it. So I'm like, why am I not getting the result? I'm doing the same thing that they're doing, but it looks night and day. So I'm curious, does which one of you have has lower empathy? I'm not talking about like how you present yourself. Like You can play the game, but like underneath. It's very complicated. I'm going to give my take. My take is that I am better at understanding people in the abstract how they think why they're thinking it what they're what's influencing them in this moment if i do a how are they going to react because i just have a ton of reps of that jorge is better at the standard definition of empathy if somebody is angry jorge's like yeah i know what it feels to be angry right if somebody is sad it's like i know what it feels to be sad right i haven't experienced as many let's say wide range of emotions but i have a very good sense sense of of like what's going on in the mind i can look at somebody's eyes and i can understand them pretty intensely pretty quickly what they're thinking how you will look like their eyes yes yeah yeah like so i think rob is pattern matching like he he's he's had the reps he's made the connections he understands he just hasn't felt that um, I have felt that, however, because of how different I was and everything, I had very few reps. So, and I was always alone in my room, not talking to anybody. So I had no reps. And instead of getting the reps, I just shunned myself from the reps. So what happened over time is that I started getting more reps and I started making more connections. Like I have a little bit of like the ability that Rob has where he can understand people in the abstract i can do that and i also have empathy so that's come up but i was like decades behind everyone else i wonder if our fans are going to be like wow i'm watching three socially incompetent people one sociopath the other one's like unpopular (laughs) the other person doesn't care (laughs) who's the sociopath who's the sociopath again (laughs) (laughs) um no, yeah, but, but it, it makes sense why we're friends, right? Like, we, we kind of think kind of similarly. We've had different backgrounds, but, like, we all kind of arrive at the same place. So, you didn't like to play the trombone, but at the beginning, you, I hated but you the trombone. You started to like it because you were good. 
And then yes. they added jogging in, and you're not good anymore. And I, and I don't like I it. It sucks so bad. And then I hate it again. I wanted to throw that trombone out the window. So for you, is it possible to like something that you're not good at? And is do you always poss- like what you're good at? I think as kind of a universal for everybody, most people will like most things that they're good at. Most people will dislike most things that they're bad at. Not true across the board. So is it possible to like something that I'm bad at? Yes, but it's rare. Do I like most of the things that I'm good at? Yes. But I think I that's not, not special to me. Mm-hmm. I saw Rob shaking his head. Yeah, no, because uh, Selena literally said the opposite. But she's oh, really? an exception. Oh, yeah. That's right. The... Yeah, so what else in high school? So I guess Status, super, super, super low. Yep. What else? Um, okay, so I'm in band. I'm freaking hating it. My grades. Oh, this, this is interesting, actually. I had had very good grades all the way up until middle school. I've never ditched in my life. I have perfect attendance. This is like a big thing for my family. You have to have perfect attendance. I don't care how sick you are. If you don't have cancer, you're going to school. Um, so like, unless you're literally dying, your ass is going to school. So I had perfect attendance and great grades all through elementary and middle school. School was really easy. Never studied, never had to try. I was always able to test extremely well. Um, then I get to high school and this is when grades start to matter because your grades affect what college you get into. I didn't freaking know what the heck college was. So I was just kind of treating it like everything else. But in high school, um, I guess because I was hanging around the wrong group, I was hanging out with a couple gamers who would ditch every day during lunch. They, they'd go to lunch, we'd go to the gaming store, we played Halo. And then most of us wouldn't come back for the second half of the class, second half of classes. So I would only go to four periods, and then the second four I wouldn't go to most of the year. And that started like late high, late, late freshman year, beginning of sophomore year, somewhere around there. So my grades started to decline severely in high school. Um, and again, I'm hanging out with this group. I mean, my I'm still hanging out with that trombone guy, the one that we're still friends, kind of. Um, and um, I remember in that group, I I was the lowest. <laughs> socially as well um because everyone kept picking on me like not bullying like physically or anything but like i was it was very easy to pick on me and i would have a big reaction so i'd get really angry and then they would pick on me more and i guess i hated hanging out with them could not stand them but they were the only friends i had (laughs) so i would ditch every day go to it was called game crazy i go to game crazy every day we'd walk there for lunch and then we wouldn't come back this was like every day so like my grades were doing really bad and i couldn't i remember i couldn't go to the games in band because my grades were too low so like a theme of high school was severely bad grades and extremely hated by teachers because from the teachers when i was in class i i felt like the material was too easy so i would kind of goof off and i would kind of like get the classroom off of the topic which my teachers didn't like but i would test extremely well so i would do really good on the test and my like when i would test my grades were really high but my homework grade was always really low so from my teacher's perspective this kid has potential but he doesn't freaking come to my class and when he comes he just starts a riot so screw this kid and this was all my teachers all my teachers hated me um so not like my students, not like my teachers, I'm ditching all the time, bad grades, just all around bad time. Family find out about you ditching school? No, because I lied and I would go to registration by myself and I would put my number down as like the contact. So I would ditch every day and then they would call me every day. So my mom never found out. And then the like school if didn't parent- know that was your number. That what? The school didn't know it was your number. Did you pick no, up? No, no, they just, you just put anything down. Whatever. It doesn't matter. They don't care. That's pretty smart. All the kids 
don't say that you didn't learn something from us. <laughs> well, I'm sure it's harder now because, like, I'm sure like they have your parents' email and they send it directly, and your your mom or dad have to like approve every homework or whatever. Like, it's probably harder now. But when I was going to school, I go to registration, put down my number, and my mom never knew nothing. So this lasted anything else? Like, this lasted for four years. Playing video yeah. games and doing porn in school. You never failed? I almost failed. I almost didn't graduate because I think my grades were there. Like, they were, like, barely passing C's. But I remember I got brought into, like, the principal's office. And he's like, we're not going to let you graduate. And I was like, why? He's like, you have, you've missed, like, more than half the year. Like, like, like like legally we can't let you do that or something like that and i don't know what i said to this man we argued for like an hour or two and at the end of it he was like all right i'll let you graduate but like i don't remember what i said i was just arguing that like i knew i knew the material the school was easier so i i don't i don't know how i convinced this man to let me graduate but he let me graduate so even though you have no social skills when it really matters, you really pull the weight. Well, I don't know if I had social skills. I was just throwing facts at the dude. <laughs> Defeat him using truth. So he could well, s- probably like sense I knew that my you stuff. were like, rational to a degree. No, yeah, like, I've always been rational. Like, my brain doesn't know how to like not follow logical statements. So. Using the principle into submission. It's very impressive. Um, so, again, no dating in high school. Very little friends, even with the friends that I, even in band, I was at the bottom of the totem pole. Even the friends that I was with, I was always getting picked on. Um, and like, I remember my best friend at the time, he's like, he's like dating like two, three girls at the time. Like he's, <laughs> he has no shortage of girls and I could not date anyone to save my life. I had no ability whatsoever. I was very pissed about that. Um, and, um, Did you think about college at any point in here? So that's what I'm getting to. No, because I had no idea what the heck college was. Um, and so this this is a really dumb story, but I I it made sense to me. Um, at some point, like, because like ma- maybe math or something, they wanted to put me into like AP math or I don't know, like college credit math or something like that. And they're like, you should do it because you can take off three hours from your college work. And I was like, I'm going to work for a whole freaking semester and it take th- for three hours? Like, I'm, I'll just do the three hours. Like, where the heck am I going <laughs> to? <laughs> um, so I didn't know it was like three credit hours and it's like a whole semester. Like, that sounds like a great deal, but they didn't explain it to me. Like, they said you could take off three hours. I was like, I'll freaking do the three hours. Why am I going to work my ass off over here? Um, so I remember that was like a conversation. My um. My counselor, <laughs> she didn't quit because of me, but I was I was in my counselor's office, and she's having a hard day, and she's talking to me. She's not even listening to what I'm saying, and in the middle of the in like the middle of the session, and this is like my my like like I don't know, like not like not like a mental counselor. She's like supposed to like guide me, like 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 credit counselors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah, academic counsel. There you go. So yeah, so I'm I'm talking to her, and in the middle of it, she's just like, "I'm sorry, I can't do this." She starts bawling, and then she quits, and I never see her again. <laughs> straw. That was the last straw. So like, this guy just has <laughs> no hope. I'm done dealing with these kids. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember she quits, and I was like, "Well." what the heck was that so then they gave me another counselor like who was like was like right out of college she knew nothing she didn't know anything about me like she like yeah so like they gave me this new person and uh she was trying to convince me to take the sat and i was like i don't know i was hard to argue with when i was in high school i felt i felt like i knew everything and i knew nothing at the same time it was so dumb um, but she tries trying to convince me that I should go to college and like should take the SAT. And I was like, I don't want to study for that. And what the heck is college for? And what am I going to do in college? And like, I don't know anyone who went to college. And I'm like, just being an asshole. Um, and um, 
like yeah so i didn't want to take the sat but then somehow i got like forced to take it but i took it while i was hung over with no calculator did horribly on it like I didn't like. I don't know. If, I don't know if this passing, but I was like, I did like barely above average. I did really bad. Um, like, had I gone, had I been in any other state or anything, I don't think I could get into any college. It's just by pure luck that I was in El Paso that I got into a college. Then you go to community college or what? Yeah. So, well, actually, no. I started working when I was sixteen, seventeen at a call center. Because El Paso is a bilingual hub. So if you're like AT&T or anybody, you you want people who speak both English and Spanish so that you don't have to hire a whole English workforce and a whole Spanish workforce. You just hire one guy who knows both languages and he can take both English and Spanish calls. So there was a lot of call centers in El Paso. Remember, I tried to get like, I was trying to get a job because I wanted money because I was poor my whole life. I was like 16. I'm looking for a job. I go to like Domino's and I have no idea how to interview. I have no idea what a good interview looks like or anything. I didn't even know you had to interview. I thought you just go and say, I need a job. And they're like, okay, you start Monday. I thought that's how it worked. And they're like, okay, well, we'll set up an interview. And I was like, oh crap, there's an interview. I don't know what the heck that was. And I don't know what, what to think in an interview, what to say in an interview. So I go to the interview for Domino's and, um, I, uh, the guy's like going through his questionnaire and the questions are easy. Like they're so dumb. And like the dude was just kind of like going through the motions. Like he didn't even care about my answers. So he was like, I don't know. Tell me about a time where like you had to like overcome something. I was like, Oh, like, okay. Well, if you don't know that one, then you don't know this one either. Um, and um, I was like, I don't know. Are you, are you willing to work weekends? And I was like, I thought about it. And I'm not thinking, like, what does the employer want to hear? Like, what are they looking for? I'm just like, no, I don't want to work weekends. I thought <laughs> I'm going to get the job, and then I don't have to work weekends now, so I win. <laughs> um, it's like so they taking ask, your, your orders at a restaurant. Yeah. Do whatever so, you want. So I was like, this dude's going to hire me no matter what. Do I want to work weekends? No, I don't. <laughs> Um, so I don't get the job. <laughs> and like, I think you have to be like borderline insane to not get this job, but I did not get that job. <laughs> I don't know why it's so funny to me. <laughs> um, so then my cousin's dating like some guy and the guy's like a deadbeat. Like this dude's a nobody and he's working at a call center. I'm like, if that guy can get a job at a call center, there's no way they're not hiring me. Um, so I go to this call center, I'm 16 and all they do is they give you a little paper and you read it and then they flip it over and you read it in Spanish. You're hired. You start Monday. You find a job. <laughs> there you go. Let's no go. questions asked. You work on weekends though? I did. I worked a lot. They just didn't ask. They, they just didn't ask. They just put my schedule in and it had weekends. Smart. Um, uh, but yeah, so like how the call centers work is everyone gets hired unless you're like violent during the interview. Like unless you attack your interviewer during the interview, you're hired. And um, they put you on the phones for like a few weeks. And if you suck, you you get cut. Or if you, a lot of people just walk out. I remember I sat next to a couple of people that, that were on the phones for like three, four hours. And they're like, dude, I cannot do this. Like this, is, I'm done. I'm walking out. And they just leave. And they wouldn't come back. Um, that happened a lot. <laughs> um, what makes you suck at the call center? Like, so you... depend depends on the call center. But the call center that I was in was a market research call center, uh, which has since closed down, and I'm pretty sure it was one of the most shady places I've ever seen in my life. Um, but um, so we were doing market research, so we would call people and like beg them for their time to do a survey. So this survey could be like for Salem cigarettes. It could be for Windex. It could be for a lot of political surveys, which are a complete scam, son. Um, but Let's yeah. get into that. Why is it a scam? Oh, man. It was like, 
I and there might be reputable research companies out there that are not doing this, but this is what I remember. It was so bad. Like um, every every survey that we would do had an obvious bias. Like you could tell who was paying for that. Like, um, let's say that um, I don't know. Person X is paying for the survey. I, I know who it is because I, I've read the survey. Um, but the questions would be like, um, like, are you Democrat or Republican? In most things, are you liberal or conservative or whatever? And you start like that. And then, uh, can you, do you know person X who's paying for the survey? And they would say, actually, no, I don't. I went, okay. Well, did you know that person X did this amazing thing? Or did you know that person X is an amazing thing? And then, and then you do like 20, you do like 10 or 10 or 15 of these like amazing things this person has done. And then you would ask, do you know person Y who X is running against? And well, did you know that this person did this horrible thing? And did you know that this person wants to cut your like education budget or whatever? And, and then that was a survey that was market research. Like, (laughs) are these, I guess. People that paid for the survey are they business owners, researchers? Um, well, to me, like the political ones, it seemed like it was whoever the political candidate or the, their campaign was paying for the survey and calling people and telling them our candidate is amazing and the other guy sucks real bad. And um, yeah, we we did market research. Okay, so call center, and then how do you get to community college from there? Um, so I was I started off at, at a call center when I was sixteen, and I moved up really quickly because I was real good on the phones, and um, yeah, my rate was always really high. And then I kind of I become a floor walker, so like I'm walking the floor, and then let's say somebody on the phones pisses off somebody, or they want to get put on the do not call list, and they say I want to talk to a manager. I'm not a manager, but I was the manager you spoke to. Um, so I was a floor walker for a bit, and then I became kind of like a shift supervisor. Like, not, not I wasn't a really like my official title, but at some points, like the night I was in charge of the night shift. Um, so I was getting paid more, and I was I was making pretty good money. So I didn't think I was going to go to community college. I thought I was just going to like work at the call center and then figure out life from there. Um, but I had, I don't remember who told me, but I had a friend who told me, well, why aren't you going to community college? And I was like, well, one, I don't want to pay. Two, I hate school. Like, what the heck's the point? And he's like, but you can get paid. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, you're, you're a Mexican. <laughs> Selena's like, what? <laughs> you get paid for going to college? Apparently. Um, so he's like, you're Hispanic, you're a minority, you're low income, you get the Pell Grant automatically. And I was like, what's that? He's like, well, they, the, the government pays you to go to school. And I was like, well, how much do they pay you? And it was like three, four grand. And I was like, how much? And he was like, but well, community college is only two grand. So you go full time to community college, they will give you four and you pocket the difference. And you were just like, I'm in. I'm in. I'm sold. Let's go. <laughs> this is the only way I ended up in college. Like well, literally. You only like, been in college because for the, money. For, for the money. I would be working at a call center today if that guy had not said that. That's kind of crazy, isn't it? <laughs> um but it's yeah, like happenstance. So... <laughs> okay. So then uh, so, you... <laughs> so I remember I go to community college and I've never studied in my life. I like, I remember I took like a history class, or something. I really liked the history teacher. He was so cool. I remember his name, Mr. Turok. Um, and, uh, I took like a, just either like either just a history class or a history class and an English class. I remember what I took, but I remember first semester history and I'm in there and I've never studied in my freaking life. I don't know how to study, but he's like, okay, guys. We're going to have a midterm and we're going to cover all this material. Make sure you know all these things by the midterm. And I was like, it was a lot. It was a lot of material for me. Like now, objectively, it's like easy peasy. It's like two days of stuff. But at the time, it felt like, oh my God, I'm going to need to know all this for the test. And I don't know it. 
So I was like, I'm going to like try real hard. Uh, so I studied and I didn't know how to study. Didn't know how to take notes. I sucked real bad, but I, I put in the effort. I did really good in the class. I got an A. I remember the teacher like came after up, up to me like afterwards. He was like, you're like one of my best students. You asked really good questions. You're really interested. If I'm doing any research. They want to do something with me or whatever. Like he was like super interested in me. Um, so that was like the first semester. I do great. I got an A. Uh, at some point, someone says the words, you, why are you working so hard in community college? And I was like, well, like, isn't like getting good grades, like good for you. He's like, no, it doesn't matter. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, you're going to go to UTEP, right? Like University of Texas at El Paso. And I was like, probably, I don't know. He's like, well, when you go to UTEP, your GPA doesn't transfer. You could have a 4.0, you could have a zero. It doesn't matter. Like it just, it just won't transfer. You'll start fresh in Utah. So once I heard that, I was like, okay, perfect. So now I don't have to study. I can just take classes, get the money and work more hours in my job, get more money and get paid by the Pell Grant. Beautiful. Let's go. So I stopped trying completely. My GPA tanked. It was horrible, but I was just, C's get degrees, son. For all four years, did you finish the community college degree? Uh, yes, by accident. <laughs> um, <laughs> so to me, community college was like, I'm going to take classes that are interesting to me and I'm going to get paid while I'm working at, as a call, at the call center. Um, and I was like taking like philosophy and psychology and sociology and like all the ologies. And it was like super interesting to me. And I took English like three times because I could not for my life of me write those papers. I could just couldn't do it. I, it was so bad. I hated English. Um, but philosophy was really cool. Sociology was really cool. Psychology was really cool. Um, and they, they, at some point they told me that I had to declare a major and I didn't know what to pick. And I didn't know that picking mattered. So I was, I declared as a philosophy major in community college. So I was a philosophy major and I'm just taking classes, taking classes, taking classes. And at some point I meet the requirements for an associate's degree at community college. I didn't know that. I wasn't trying to get a degree. I'm just trying to get paid while I, I work at a call center. Um, so, um, they tell me your graduation is on this day. And I wasn't even trying to graduate. I don't go to the graduation. I tell my mom about it. I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to go. I don't care. Um, and she was really upset with me that I didn't go to the graduation. Um, so I don't go. And then I try to do the same spiel again the next semester. I go to register and I try to pick my classes or whatever. And my financial aid gets denied. And I'm like, like, I go talk to the financial aid office and I'm like, what the heck's going on? And they're like, dude, you, you graduated. Why are you trying to register? And I was like, well, this, this is what I always do. This is what I do every semester. He's like, you, you have an associate's degree. You, you have to leave. You can't take classes here anymore. <laughs> okay. So then what? So then I'm forced to go to UTEP, like suddenly out of nowhere. <laughs> I have to so is transfer. it like an automatic you get in or what? Like you have to apply? Because I'm Mexican. It's El Paso. Like, because <laughs> like the whole point of UTEP, this is my interpretation. I'm just going to say this. But my interpretation of UTEP, which is the University of Texas at El Paso, is that they are just there to kind of help uplift the Hispanic community that's coming over from, from, from Juarez. So I think that they just let everyone in and if you make it through like the weeder out classes, you make it to like thermodynamics or calculus, then you're allowed to stay in. And if you don't make it, like most people get weeded out. But if you, like, I think they just give everybody a shot. And if you make it, you make it. So then they force you to go to UTEP. And then what is that like? Or what is that process like? Yeah. So it was, it was all very rushed because like I was like, registration had already started and I was doing everything last minute because I didn't know I was going to go to UTEP. So I had to like go through all like, like the, the academic counselors and all that stuff. And at this point they're like, okay, this is what you got to do. So I go, I go to the registration process at UTEP 
And one of the first questions they asked me is like, what's your major? And like, I don't think I covered this already. So in, in community college, I was taking like all the philosophy classes and all the ologies. And I had talked to my philosophy professor and she had asked me, uh, what do you plan on doing for your career? And I'd never thought about that before. Um, but I told her like, I really like philosophy. I really like teaching. I want to be a philosophy professor. Cause like, I knew I didn't want to teach high school. So like, so if you're going to teach high school, you're going to teach college. So you got to be a professor. And all I knew at the time was that to be a professor, you need a PhD. So I was like, okay, I'm going to get a PhD. I'm going to do philosophy done. And she was like, don't do it. Like, no way. <laughs> because that was the path that she took. And she's like, I can't even pay for my medicine right now. So she's like, do anything else. Just don't do what I did. So I was like, okay, well then what do I do? And she asked me like, I don't know. What, what do you, what are you good at? What do you like? I was like, I'm good at math. I'm like, great, perfect. Go, go be an engineer. So she had, she had mentioned that a couple years prior. And now I'm at UTEP trying to declare a major and I don't know what to say. So I say engineering and they say, okay, which one? And I'm like, there's more than one. Like, I, I didn't know that. So like the, and like the kid behind the desk is just kind of like now explaining to me what engineering is. And he's explaining to me what the different engineerings are. And like my university at the time only had four, they have more now, but they, they had mechanical, they had electrical, they had civil and they had industrial. And I didn't know what any of those terms meant. So I just like asked the guy like, okay, like, like what's electrical? And he was like, yeah, uh, I hear that that one's kind of hard. Some people don't like that. Like, do you like chemistry? And I said, no. He's like, okay, then don't do electrical. Cause like they say that, like, you have to do a lot of stuff that you can't see. Um, and then I asked him about what's civil and he said, that one's a lot like mechanical, but there's like an extra test that you need to take for that one. So I was like, okay, screw that one. And then I asked about industrial and he said, honestly, I don't know what industrial engineering is. Like, all I know is that like a lot of girls go into that, like, but that didn't really make sense to me. Um, but like now knowing what I know now like since I'm a very like process oriented person, I probably should have gone into industrial engineering, but I just like, yeah, it just didn't make sense to me that like, like, like it's like gender specific. Like why are girls going over here? Why are guys going here? I, I just didn't understand. Um, and then I asked him a little mechanical and he said, yeah, that one's like a lot of, a lot of people like that one. It's kind of, it's kind of broad. And as you work with your hands, I was like, okay, well, sure. Like mechanical it is. And then I became a mechanical engineer. And at this point, like my perception right now is that you're a person who's like has a lot of context into like how the world works. And maybe it's because you're on YouTube now, right? You're like, okay, this is how sales works. This is how marketing works. This is business. This is engineering. This is content creation. You have all this context. But at this time in your life, it seems you're, you don't really, you're not trying to plan ahead. So I'm just curious, like, what was going on in your head at this point? Do you just not care? Do you just not have the context? Do you not know? Like, why is it that you were, didn't even want to go and search on Google or something? Like, which career fits me versus just trusting some random person? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. I, I think it was definitely obvious to me. It's obvious to me now that at the time, I didn't really know how to research. I'd never done that. Like I've gone all through high school, all through like community college. Cause I honestly felt the community college was like chiller than high school. I don't know if that's crazy to y'all, but I definitely had to work less hard in community college. The classes were so easy. Um, so I just never been forced to research anything. I felt I didn't really know how to do that. Um, all that I think happened in college, like college was actually hard and that's where like, I learned how to Google. I see. And then, so you get into UTEP and what is that transition from community college to, I guess, state school, like rough, <laughs> how I would describe it. It was, it was night and day. Cause again, high school was super easy, never studied. Community college, I tried at the beginning and then didn't try again. Super easy, didn't study. And now I'm in college and I'm registering late. 
So I'm like, there weren't that many classes available that I could register for. So I think like the only thing that I could get in like last minute was like thermal fluid sciences, um, which didn't make any sense because I had never taken Cal one and I've never taken physics. And there's no way that you should be allowed into thermal fluids without knowing physics. Cause I remember, um, like the, the professor that I had, it was like some Russian guy, like real, real tough guy. <laughs> um, he, he had like, um, uh, he had these quizzes, like he had, he had everyone like get bringing these clickers and, um, he would make us all take quizzes. Um, and in one of the quizzes in his class, he had asked like a really, really simple question about like, like, uh, the laws of motion. And I, I was like the only one in the room that got it wrong. Cause I'd never taken physics. I didn't know the laws of motion. Um, so he pointed me out, he like calls me out and he's like, how did you get this wrong? And I was like, well, I don't know. I've never seen that before. He's like, you've taken physics. I was like, I haven't taken physics. He's like, how are you here? Like, how did you get in this classroom without taking physics? I was like, I don't know. It was, it was available to register for. I was like, okay, well, good luck. But, <laughs> um, yeah, no, like it was, it was a very, very, very rough start. Um, and, the, and this, this class specifically is like really memorable to me because it was like the first like hard class I'd ever taken in my life. Um, and I remember I try to do like the exact same thing that I had always done. So I pretty much do nothing all semester. And right before the test, I start studying and then I get a, a C or B or whatever. Um, so I try to do that. And he had, he had told us like the only grades in the class are, um, your midterm and your final. And, and there was even a caveat that like, there was like a lifeline. If you got a higher grade on the final, which was usually harder than the midterm, then the, the final would, the final grade would take over your midterm. So pretty much the, there's only one test. The final test determines your grade. If you do better on that one than in the midterm. And I remember like I like didn't really do much in that class, like the entire time. The midterm is like in like two weeks or something. And he says that there's going to be a review session. Like, okay, perfect. I'll go to the review session. I'll learn everything the day before, or like, like it was like three days before. And then I'll study hard for two days, take the exam, get a C, get a B, good to go. I show up to them to the review session and he's calling people up to like do problems on the board. And like some girl will go up and she's like, okay, well, here are, here are my knowns and here are my unknowns and here's what we're looking for. And she had like a process and like, where did you learn this? Like, I've never seen, I've never seen anyone do anything like this. And, and then the next person goes up and they, they do the exact same thing. And the next person goes up and like engineering problems are like, you find the first thing and then you use that to find the second thing, you use that to find the third thing, you use that to find the fourth thing. And then like, it's like one problem is like five steps. And I couldn't even do step one. Like I had, I couldn't even follow. I had no idea what they're doing. So like I left the review session, like in the middle of it. And I was like, I'm not even going to show up to the midterm. Like there's no hope. So I, I didn't show up to the midterm and I had a fat zero in that class at the midterm. And then after the midterm, like everybody starts dropping, like half the class left after the midterm because they got destroyed. So yeah, so I, yeah, I get a zero. And everyone's, everyone's dropping and they ask me like, if they're going to drop, because like, I have like literally the lowest grade in the class. And I like, I'm just being cocky at this point. I was like, no, I like, don't, I'm, I'm not going to drop. I'm going to figure it out. Um, and we had had a professor as a substitute at one point, his name was Dr. Hawkins. Um, and this dude like changed my life. He, he probably doesn't know it, but this dude like, like completely changed the trajectory of my career um, because I didn't feel very comfortable going to the Russian guy. Cause I didn't know any, like I've been in this class for months and I didn't know anything, but Dr. Hawkins had come in as a substitute and he like, he was really good, explained everything really well. He was really nice. And he said, I'm in this room. If you guys have any questions, my door is always open. Come on in. I'll help you out. So I didn't feel comfortable going to the Russian guy. So I went to Dr. Hawkins and I just went in and I was like, Hey, here's where I'm at. I, the metro just happened. I got a zero. I, I don't, I don't 
I, I haven't studied. I don't know anything. Like, I'm trying to pass. Like, and he's like, yeah, yeah, come down, come down. Let's just sit down. Let's do a couple problems. And like, it's not that bad. It'll be okay. So he sat me down. We, we did a couple problems. He walked me through the process. It was all very methodical and pretty repetitive, I felt. And yeah, so like for the next couple, like month or two, I was in his office every day just doing problems. And he would give me homework and I'd bring him the next day and we review them. And yeah, like just from, from there, like he kind of taught me how to study. He taught me like, like there's like, there's this many problems in the book. If you do this many of them, like if you do X number of them, you should be fine for the test. Just know what's going to be on the test. Know what chapters you need to cover, do the problems and you'll be fine. And that's what I did all of college. Cause like I, when I showed up to college, I had already taken all the I had taken all the histories, all the Englishes, all the psychologies. So all that was left was like the actual hard classes, the engineering classes. And he was like, he pretty much showed me the rubric. Like you do X number of problems, you go to office hours, you talk to your teacher, and then you just, you just do the problems and then you're done. So I ended up doing really well in the final. I actually got a perfect score in the final and the Russian guy didn't believe me. And he like brought me into his office and like questioned me. Cause like, he was like, there's no way dude, like you had a zero coming in and you're like, now you're walking out with an A in my class. Like there's just no way. Um, so he grilled me in his office. I got the A, but at this point, like go to Dr. Hawkins. I had, I pretty much had the recipe. You just, you do X number of problems. You go to office hours, you, you study a lot. And then it's like guaranteed A. So yeah, like, because of him, like I, I did really, really well in college. Like I ended up like a really, really, really high GPA. How come you were able to stay on phase? Unlike other people, like other people, when they heard that the class is hard or they got a bad uh, grade for the midterm, they drop out and you're like, yeah, I can do it. I've never done it before, but I think it's okay. <laughs> I think it was just delusion. Like, <laughs> I don't think it makes sense. Um, I, I think I I didn't have a lot of confidence growing up, like about anything. But the only thing I was confident about was that I like I was intelligent, like I I felt smart, um, and I don't I don't really like I know that that sounds like really cocky to say, but I don't really see it that way. Like to me, like having like your IQ is just like your height. Like some people are six feet tall, some people are four feet tall, some people are five feet tall. Like there's no like, I, I know people associate a lot of baggage to that, like being smart is good and, and not being smart is bad. But to me, like, it's literally just height. It's just an objective measure. But IQ is like intelligence is maybe a little bit more nuanced, but IQ, like, I think it's just, it's measurable and, and you can, you can either be high, it could be low. And I felt like my IQ was higher on average than people around me. So that's like something that I never really questioned. I felt I was smart. So I felt I could figure it out. So you're at UTEP, you take your first series of classes, you're doing well. What happens next? Um, so I'm, I'm doing well. And then I get like an opportunity. Like I, I really like thermodynamics and I had done really well in thermodynamics. And then I took another, like a more advanced thermodynamics class with, the professor that ended up becoming my advisor because I was still on the path to be a professor. I just wasn't going to be a philosophy professor. Now I wanted to be a engineering professor. I was really liking engineering because I think as I was doing well. Um, so I had like decided, okay, I'm getting, I'm still getting a PhD. I'm going to be a professor, but now I'm going to be an engineering professor. And to do that, I need to do research. At this point, I was learning how to Google. So, okay, I need to do research. To do research, what do I got to do? I got to get, I get, I get an advisor. So I like, I talked to like my thermodynamics professor, and I was like, okay, I want to, I want to do research with you. And he said, well, I don't really have a slot right now because I didn't know this, but like apparently, uh, like how it works is that the professor needs to get grant money, and that grant money is used to pay the research assistants. But I didn't know that. I thought like you do well and you get in and you don't do well, you don't get in. Um, but 
he didn't have a grant at the time for another assistant. But he's like, there's this program going on right now that kind of can sponsor and assist uh, like research assistants. It was called Corey. And like, he was nice enough. Like he did the whole packet for me. Like he, he filled it out and I applied and I got in. So I got sponsored by Corey and I did research with Corey um, in the thermal fluids lab. Um, and yeah, like that's how I started doing research. And then I stayed in that lab, like all through my master's. And do you think like in research you stood out in any way or were you just like an average Joe? Uh, bit of both. So this is, I guess, I think this is where like, I kind of started struggling a little bit where I started noticing that like if my professor would give me a task that I thought was really boring, I wouldn't do it. But like sometimes he would give me a task that was really hard and I would do really well. So I had like really mixed reviews. Like the other guy, like the PhD guy that, that I was working with, he was really happy with me because he felt that I was going out there and trying to solve problems and like, um, and like, like relieving a lot of like stress on him. But like my professor would tell me, go like copy this from this over here, like copy, go read these research papers and copy the information from here to here. And that was like an impossible task for me to do. I could not do it, but other tasks I could do. So like, we'll get into this later when we get into work, but yeah, I, I struggled doing tasks that were boring. At what point did you start doing research and realize you don't want to become a professor anymore? Yeah, that, that took a while. Um, so I'm doing research and like I wanted to work on rockets and I'm in a high high pressure combustion lab, which is kind of similar. Um, but it's a lot of chemistry and I really don't like chemistry. But like I felt like this is a path for me to get into like rocket research, and I eventually want to want to work for NASA or Blue Origin or something. Um, and I notice I really, really don't like doing the research. But I thought that it was because I didn't like what I was researching. I thought I didn't like high pressure combustion. I wanted to work on rockets. So if I can just get to work on rockets, then research will be cool. But then I had the opportunity to work on rockets doing research and I still didn't care. So I was like, oh, like I, I just don't like research. Like I, I just hate research. So I like really changed my plans a lot. Like I had to like find a job last minute. But yeah, I yeah, that that realizing that I didn't like research kind of killed my PhD plans. Because to me it, it didn't really make any sense. And I guess it still doesn't make sense to me now. Like because at universities, professors aren't teachers first, researchers second. They're researchers first, teachers second. But like they pitch it as like this place for, for, of higher education where kids are supposed to learn. But that's not the product. That's not that's not what the school cares about. The school cares about making money and they make money through research grants. And oh, yeah, we have to teach students too. But let's focus on the football team. How come you're not interested in research if you're interested in like doing YouTube research? I, what I've realized over time is that the, the daily tasks matter to me way more than the overall goal. Um, and this may, I'm not sure if this is like a more than me thing, but for, for me, it's definitely true that the, the tasks that I have to do every day, if those are fun, I can do, I can do the job for a long time. If the tasks that I have to do every day, and most of them are boring, I can't do that for very long. So I felt like research was reading really dense, really boring research papers most of the time and kind of slamming your face against the wall like when an experiment doesn't go well. And it was it's just like a horrible profession for me. It's just like it's not it's not a lot of really fun stuff. Like when you when you get an experiment that goes well, which is like years into the making. That's really cool, but the day-to-day -day activities are really boring for me. Okay, so you were doing research, you're doing well at community college or at UTEP. Now what? 
what is the next step in like your journey? Yeah, so I get a random email that changed the whole trajectory of everything. Um, and I don't even know how this email ended up getting to me, honestly. I had taken a class with another professor, and he, he's known for being kind of tough. Um, and I had done well in his class, and I had like, I would stop every now and then by his office, and we have like philosophical conversations, so that's always still happening with me. And, um, yeah, but like, we're not, we're not friendly. I, 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 I talk to him every like two months or something every now and then when I see him in his office. Um, and then I get an email saying that, Hey, we just started a partnership with a school in Japan, uh, a couple years ago. And they've sent a study, like an exchange student last semester. And they're asking us to send one to to Japan. I think you'd be perfect for it. Let me know if you're interested. So I was like, sure. So I go to his office. He tells me the whole spiel. And he's like, okay, so you'll pay for your tuition here at UTEP. That tuition will cover the tuition in Japan. And you'll just study in Japan for a semester. And then, like, I'd never gone anywhere. Like, the, like I think I'd gone on a plane once to, like, Cancun. But, like, my life was, like, I knew El Paso. I knew Juarez. And I've been to Cancun once. And then they threw my ass in Japan and there was just like an alien planet over there. It was crazy. So you've never been abroad. You probably, do you speak Japanese? No. No <laughs> Japanese. Japanese. How do you make friends? Um, yeah. So this is like a big transition actually. Cause like so far the story is I really don't have any social skills. I, I can't, I can't talk. I can't dress. I don't have any friends, even in the uncool crowds, those people think I'm weird and I can't be friends with them. Um, but people in Japan don't know that nobody in Japan knows anything about my background. So I just decided before I left, like, I'm just gonna pretend like this is not me. Like this is not my life. I'm just going to pretend that I have friends and I'm not weird and I'm just going to see what happens. So I, I go to Japan and they put you like in an, an international house um, where like all the exchange students are, are living there. So like in my dorm, it was like Italians and French and Chinese and Africans and like from everywhere. And we don't we don't know anybody. No one speaks Japanese. So like we all hung out all the time. And these were all master students. So they were very intellectual. They liked discussion. They liked, they were very passionate about their research and I could ask them about their research forever. Um, so yeah, like I, this is like, another, like where I felt like I was starting first starting to meet people that thought a little bit like me that didn't think I was just absolutely bananas. So I go to Japan and I'm like, I'm not, I'm not going to be like this person who doesn't have any friends. I'm going to try to be social. I go to Japan. People are more intellectual and I make a ton of friends. Like I'm friends with everybody in Japan. Um, and also like I, I, I went there with the full intention of learning Japanese and they like, put us like in like a, a Japanese class to like learn Japanese. But like, I noticed that the Japanese really love Americans, which I wasn't expecting because of like the whole world war two thing. Um, like Americans love uh, Japanese love us. So like, as soon as they found out that I had an American accent, everybody was like, Hey, let's be friends. Like I want to practice my English. So like, if I just speak English, I can make friends like without any effort, without even trying, I can make friends. So I just spoke English the entire time. And uh, like, what else in Japan did you do? It's like you went there specifically for research. Yeah. I and I guess you get there and the first thing is like, I'm going to make friends and be social for the first time in my life. Yeah. I, I did not do research in Japan. Um, I was in the lab, but I they didn't really have anything to, for us to do. I think they had like really low expectations of us. It was mainly, we sent a guy over there. He didn't do much. Send a guy over here. He doesn't have to do much. Just we're, we're exchanging. We're doing a trade. Um, so yeah, like I had classes 
and I had classes with my, like my, like the professor from my lab and, um, and yeah, but I, I don't think they had a lot of tasks for me and it was more like help out your fellow team. It was, it was mainly on get to know Japan. And if you're interested in, in, in working here in Japan, there was an offer for me to go do my PhD there. Not because they they care about me. Like I think they they notice that like Japanese struggle a lot with language. Japanese struggle a lot with being, I guess, like a little bit more forward. They're really timid. They don't really talk much. It's hard for them to talk to foreigners. So I think they were trying to get like some more Americans who are a little bit more aggressive in the lab to to counterbalance that. So I don't think they wanted researchers. I think they just wanted a different mentality in the lab. And did anything else happen when you were in Japan? Yeah, a lot happened. Um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I, I think this like this is like the, the main thing is that like I was I was social. Like you know, like we talked about, like I haven't really put in any reps. Like I'm very awkward, but in Japan, I'm I'm friends with everybody. I'm 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 not doing research. I'm throwing just parties all the time, and like I ended up meeting my wife there. Um, and yeah, that's, that's like a whole can of worms, but yeah, I mean, I mean my wife there and I was there for like a total of six months. And then I, I come back and me and my wife start doing like a long distance relationship because she stayed in Japan. How long was the program? Six years, six months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So at this point, you're still an engineer, right? Yeah, I'm. I'm doing my master's in. Well, I'm a mechanical engineer, but like the program I'm, I'm studying in is aerospace engineering. Mm -hmm. So you're still doing research. Didn't realize oh, that you don't. This is like this research. is actually no, like this is actually a huge, because now I'm in Japan doing rocket research. This is where like the the realization that I hate research happened, because. Like the entire time I'm doing research for like three years and I'm like, I hate this, but I hate this because it's, it's proposed. It's not, it's not rockets, but then I go to Japan and they throw me in a rocket lab and I'm doing rocket research and I still hate it. So then I had to like, when I come back, I had to like figure out how am I going to get a job because this entire time I've been going to career fairs and I don't make a resume. I don't interview with anybody. I don't practice. I don't do anything. Cause I know I'm just going to go get a PhD, but yeah, it's like last minute. I have to like scramble now to get a job because I realized that like my, my profession is like not an option for me. At that point where you're like, Oh, I'm screwed. Or you're like, hmm, that's fine. I'll do it. Um, I mean, I don't think I'm ever like, Oh, I'm screwed. It's more like, Oh, that's bad. And then it's like, that's bad for like a day. And then, okay, let's, let's figure this out. What can I do? Um, I actually got really lucky because right before I went to Japan, I had applied to a scholarship who like my best friend had gotten. She was also Hispanic and she was like, she was the, uh, the vice president of Society of Women Engineers. She had just gotten the scholarship sponsored by ExxonMobil. And she's like, you should apply. I think you can get it because we both had high GPAs. Yeah. So I applied and I got it right before I went to Japan. And the scholarship came with a mentor. Um, it's like six meetings or whatever. But like they say it's like a career mentor, but it's not really that. Like they're, they're, they're poaching. Um, essentially, the mentor's job is to figure out is this person a good fit for Exxon? And if they are, get them an interview and kind of like push them up the chain so that they pass the interview. That's how it felt like to me. Um, it had happened to my, my best friend uh, in college too, but she didn't do well in the interview. So she, she couldn't get an internship or a job or anything. Um, oh, well, she was applying for a job. She, 
she was she was graduating with her bachelor's and she wasn't going to do an uh masters so when this happened for her she was applying for a full-time position but i was still doing my masters so when like the interview eventually happened through exxon it was just an internship which i think is easier for me to get i'm not sure how i could have done like had i had to go straight for the full-time position cuz like exxon doesn't hire a lot no paso they get like one or two people every year but like boeing and lockheed they hire a lot more but like exxon i don't i don't know how is it at other schools but exxon was like the big name in my university um so yeah like i have like the six meetings with him He's like this Mexican guy, like like from Mexico who went to like Harvard Business School, really smart guy. I I clicked really well with him. It seemed like he liked me and he set up an interview. Um and then like this is also very lucky, I think. Um because this happened while I was in Japan and Exxon cares a lot about international travel. because i think they have the problem a lot that they they hire americans from like the midwest and these people have never they don't have a passport they've never left the us but like their job is like okay you're going to go to papua new guinea now you're going to go to guyana and like drill oil but like if you don't have any international experience that's kind of jarring and they lose people because of that and these are like very expensive trips so exxon prioritizes um international travel a lot and i was just coming back from japan so like the stars just kind of aligned this is all pure luck like me going to japan was luck like me getting the the like this specific scholarship was luck and me having international travel when i interviewed was luck so like just like the stars just aligned so that i could do well in the exxon intern the exxon interview and then i got the exxon internship which is where i met this guy What was the position in Exxon for? Like was were you excited to get it or did you kind of see it as a stepping stone to somewhere else? Yeah. Um so I I didn't really know how to feel about it because at least at the time um Exxon would call you and they'd say, "Hey, we're we're here to offer you a uh, an internship position." And they tell you how much they're going to pay you. and they pay you very similarly as an intern as a full-time employee it was like a couple thousand dollars different and i had never like i grew up on $40,000 a year like i've never heard numbers this big for a starting salary like it was crazy um so i never liked exxon had no interest in exxon didn't care about oil in the slightest but i heard that number and i was like let's go like i <laughs> i've never had money in my life so I was I was excited about the money, not necessarily excited about Exxon. And how did the experience go? Did you like the experience there? Yes. Um yes. Um kind of. <laughs> Because when when I I I didn't know this at the time, but they treat interns very differently than they treat their full-time employees. Um so my experience as an intern it was like parties all the time like we're doing activities we're going on trips we're floating the river in Austin we're joining the dodgeball team everyone's everyone's hanging out together all the time it was like 3 months of just fun and a, and and also like the work was pretty interesting um but that's not how they treat you once you become a full-time employee but I also felt like really like I don't know I like the position didn't feel very genuine to me because um the position that I was doing since I was a master student it was a very technical role because the manager that I got paired up with he he was being no well, he wasn't a manager at the time he was a lead he was being groomed for management and at Exxon in order to be like groomed for management you have to check up a couple boxes So you need to have a lead role, you have to have a technical role and you need to have a man like uh no, like a, a field role. So he had done everything on that list except the technical role. So they just created a technical role for him, which was analyzing pipelines, and they gave him an intern. So when I was at Exxon, it was extremely te- technical. I'm talking a lot of subject matter experts. 
I'm doing pipe of simulations. Like it's really, really, really fun. Like I'm redirecting like millions of gallons of, of product. So it was super fun, but that's not what I got hired for <laughs> uh, because that position doesn't exist. That position was just like created for the intern. But when I like event eventually got the job offer from Exxon, that was for a field engineer, which is just a project manager. And I'm a socially awkward, don't really know how to make friends, don't really know how to talk to anybody person. So it was like the worst job you could give me. I thought I was going to get a technical role because that's what I interned as. But yeah, it was just, it was a mess. And how did that, ex like, I guess I'm curious, when did you know that that role wasn't right for you? Um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know for like a year. Um, so like I, I, I relocate to Houston. I start my job at Exxon. Um, I find out I'm a field engineer, so I have to like wake up really early in the morning. I have to be at the field very early, 7 a.m. for the safety meeting. We're talking about safety constantly, um, which was kind of jarring. And, um, yeah, like, so essentially my role was supporting a, like a, a, um, salt dome storage facility. So like there's this big this big salt plain out in the middle of nowhere, Texas. And if you pour water on salt, you can dig a hole. It'll dissolve the water and you can have a hole and you can put product in the salt and salt doesn't mix with the product. So it was just, they were holding propylene, ethylene, like a bunch of like different chemicals like they, like if they could kill you in a second. Um, so it was like this big, big operation, but it's all being handled by like blue collar workers who've been there like, probably since they're like 18 and now they're in their forties. Like they've been working on these pipelines forever. And I'm like this awkward nerdy kid. And I come in and I have to tell them what to do or help at least help them. But like in a lot of ways, like in a lot of ways I'm below them. In a lot of ways I'm next to them. In a lot of ways I'm above them. Cause I, I can, I can affect their day a lot if I'm not doing good. So like there was a lot of struggling between like, the social aspect. Um, I had never really taken any notes all through college at all. Like I didn't really know how to take notes. Um, yeah, I never managed a project. I, I grew up an only child, didn't have a lot of social experience, never organized anything. So it was a very, very, very rough job for me at first. Um, and on top of that, my my girlfriend, my, Je my Japanese girlfriend at the time had just moved to the U S to live with me and she doesn't speak English. So at home, I'm like doing everything for her. I have to schedule doctor appointments for her. I have to do a lot of stuff. And at work, I'm like doing all these things that are very difficult for me. And Exxon's expectations are very high. Like they hire like a bunch of type a people and they hire like the best from every school. So like everyone's very like on edge about doing well. So everybody's working like 60, 70 hours. I was working 60, 70 hours plus then going home and I have to like help my wife with everything and she doesn't know anything about the U S so I have to teach her, like show her around and show her about the U S and then wake up very early. So I wasn't sleeping very much. I was very stressed and it was just like, it was just chaos. I struggled for like a whole year and yeah, like, yeah, that, that first year was just all bad. Was that when you guys first met? No, we met during the internship. That um, was the first year. Yeah. Like, yeah, well, like the, it was only three months. I, I only knew Rob. Well, Rob lied to me as we covered in the other episode <laughs> and that he didn't become my roommate, which I don't know if we would be friends right now. If I had become your roommate, we don't know. Might've been good. Might've been bad. How come? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. Like, I think living with someone is very different from being friends with somebody. So like, maybe we would be closer. Maybe we, we would have hated each other. You just, you just don't know. Do you think it will be like, sometimes friendships are broken because they live, they get too close to each other. I'm not sure if too close. I think like you might see a side of someone that you don't really see. Um, and you might not like that side. 
I guess one, it's a recap question. But, um, one question that I'm curious about is there was pre Japan Jorge, there was after Japan Jorge, then there was after work Jorge. And I'm curious, like, the question, what did you care about at these different phases? And how did that change before Japan, after Japan, and then after working? Yeah. Well, like, like the one constant in my life that just never goes away is like have like unquenchable, unquenchable thirst for understanding. I, I need to understand. I need to like break things down. I need to dig as deep as possible. And then once I've, I've dug deep enough and my brain's satisfied. Okay, cool. Next thing. That is just never, never not been there. Never going to go away kind of thing. Um, at the time. So in Japan, I think what I cared about was making friends because I've never had friends. So that was like the primary goal with Japan after Japan. I think like my primary focus was my girlfriend because like she didn't speak any English. We're doing long distance. I really want the relationship to work, but it's a lot of work. I'm waking up at like five in the morning to talk to her. She's going to sleep really late because of the time difference. So like, like she was like a huge focus of my life for a couple of years. And then like when like Exxon was like probably like the lowest point in my life because like up to that point the bar was really low um like my like pretty much everyone in my family has like had a really rough like rough life i think um and like at i'm not i'm not sure how they feel about their lives but like most i, I, don't, I don't you wouldn't find many of them that do you would say are successful like they they have families and they have like okay jobs, and I'm not not trying to look down on them. I'm just saying like I'm I'm not sure how they feel of like how they did like success wise, um, but like definitely someone looking at them wouldn't say yeah this is what you would consider success. Um, so because of like um, like what I'm trying to say is like I have friends who like everyone is a doctor. And all, and everyone's a lawyer and everyone around them has, has been a doctor. And if you're not a doctor, you just, you just failed at life. Like that's the bar for me. It was like, don't go to jail. That's the bar. Like just be a decent human being. Don't go to jail, have a family. You win. You have succeeded at life. So like the bar, which has always been extremely low for me. And I don't even remember what question I'm answering at this point. <laughs> That's a great choice. It's hmm? a great intro. <laughs> really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the question was like, what did you care about other different phases? Yeah. So Japan, friends, after Japan, like making my relationship with my girlfriend work and um, like, um, yeah. So like my whole life, the, the bar had been very low. So objectively i'm not doing great i'm barely going to community college i have like a deadbeat job i do okay in college me doing okay in college was like i am like the top of the top in my family like no one had done as good as i had done in college um no one had even got to college so the perception that i have is like i'm kicking butt at life and then i get research and I'm kicking butt at life. And then I go to Japan and I'm kicking butt at life. And like my GPA is really high. So I'm just like, I'm, like from my perspective, I'm like crushing it academically. Like, like I have no friends and I have no social skills. That's in the, like in the shithole, but I am crushing it career wise. And then I go to Exxon and I get destroyed. So like I have, from my perspective, I have nothing now. I didn't have the social stuff. And like I'm really struggling at work because the the work stress I'm really struggling in my relationships like my life is just falling apart in every single possible way. Like this was like the lowest of the low. So this is like what we're going to call the the rebuild phase. Because I have no idea what I'm doing with my life at this point. Like it's just like yeah, it's everything's falling apart. 
How do you turn it around? How did I turn it around? I don't even know. So I, I, I think one big thing is um, because of like all the work stuff, like my relationship with my wife is really struggling because like the stress from work is not making me a great person to be around at home. And she also doesn't speak English. And there's a huge culture gap because like Mexicans and Japanese could not be further apart from each other. So this led to a lot of like relationship issues. So we started going to couples counseling and in couples counseling, like a lot of stuff starts coming out um, that I had no idea about. Um, like, for example, it is there that we kind of discover like, oh, you probably have ADHD. Like no one had ever said those words to me. Like I had no idea what that meant, but like, it was very obvious once she mentioned it and I started researching like, Oh yeah, for sure. I have ADHD. Like, but before that, like no one had, had ever said that. And like, I should have been diagnosed like way early. Cause like I'm doing very well in school, but I cannot focus to save my life. So yeah, like, yeah, I should have been, if I had gone to a better school, that should have been caught early. And my parents knew that should have been caught earlier, but nobody knew. So I get, I figure out I have ADHD and I start reading a bunch of books about that. And I start understanding that and I find other people that have ADHD and that was extremely helpful. Um, and then, so we're, we're going to couples counseling and my mom keeps getting in the way of couples counseling. <laughs> um, because me and my wife are trying to like work through our problem and then the therapist starts digging and digging and digging. And then, oh, Jorge has this problem because his mom did X. Or Jorge has this problem because his mom did Y. Or Jorge has this problem because his mom did Z. And, like, we just keep ending up at, like, Jorge's mom. And they were like, dude, you're, like, messed up. Like, we cannot proceed forward. Like, we're not making progress here because you need, like, your own therapy just to talk about your mom. So, so they did that. <laughs> they, so I had like couples counseling and they gave me my own personal therapist separate from the couple counselor just so I could talk about my mom. And that, that went on for like a year, um, which was like probably like the best thing that ever happened to me because like I could not have the relationship I have now with my mom had that not happened. Like I, I was just like closing the door on that. I was like, I don't even, I don't even want to look there. But yeah, like counseling just really brought everything out. What came out of your individual counseling? Like, what did you realize about your relationship with your mom? Um, I, I think like the main thing was I felt, and this is not necessarily my mom's fault. I just want to preface that. I think I felt like I was a child but I had to be the adult for my mom. I felt like my mom was the child most of the time. She couldn't control her emotions. She couldn't, she couldn't pay her bills. She couldn't be responsible. She like, yeah, like, uh, my mom was a hard worker, but like, she wasn't nice to people. Like I felt like I had to like, had, I had to like mend relationships for her. I had to tell her that that's not true. You can't lie but she was always lying. So like, it felt like when I was like 13, 14, 15, like I'm a child. Like, why are you like not doing any of these things that I know you have to do, but I need to do them for you. So like, yeah, like that was like the main thing. I felt like I didn't really have a parent. I was the parent when I shouldn't have been the parent. And after the counseling sessions, what did you realize? Like after these realizations or discoveries, how did it help you mend your relationship with your mom? Uh, well, at first it didn't. At first it made it worse. <laughs> at first, I think I didn't really realize how messed up my childhood had been until like I would say some of the stuff to like my therapist and they were like their eyes would be like, whoa. And yeah, like to me, they didn't feel like that big a deal, but to them, it was a pretty huge deal. Um, 
So I, I think it started like calibrating like, oh, okay. Like that's not normal. I didn't know that. Um, so yeah, like understanding where I kind of fit in like the like, grand scheme of things was really good. Um, but yeah, like at first I was re- like, just made me angrier at her because I felt like, like we're just talking about her being an issue all the time. So at first I made things worse and then I had my son and then she, she was still trying to, I guess, yeah, like I, I think from a mom's perspective, it was a lot of like, I'm your mom, therefore you have to do X. I'm your mom, therefore you have to do Y. Like, and I didn't feel like she had earned that. I didn't feel she had earned the right to say that. Like just, just being a mother is not enough. Like you have to do stuff. Um, so I was like really, really closing the door on her and then she changed and the combination of her changing and me had already like processing that a lot in counseling just yeah allowed us to like kind of mend that relationship. So now you, you're in couples counseling and then you got your individual ther- therapy mom issue got resolved. You come back to the couple therapy. How did that turn out? Well, the couple therapy was always going on. It was just, I I had two counselors. I had a couples therapist and I had my own personal therapist. But like the couples therapist felt like we couldn't really make progress because of all the the issues with my mom. Um, No, but a couples couples therapy was really helpful because I think like I was very alone as a child and I was very set in my ways. So I had never really had to, and I also didn't have a lot of friends. So I had just hadn't experienced a lot of like, like this is how other people think and this is how other people do things. And like, this is how you share and this is how you divide up stuff. And like, I just not had any of those lessons. And at first it just seemed like my wife was crazy. Like, like this doesn't make any sense, but in counseling, like, I was like, oh, okay. So that's why you're doing that. Like, like that's the perspective that you're looking at this from. Like, that makes sense. So like the counselor helped me see that a lot of the things that my wife was doing, which didn't make any sense to me, actually make sense. And then I'm like, okay, you see the world this way. Therefore, what you're doing makes sense. So like now, now I understand. So you're very easy to change your mind or your perspective on things as long as they can give you a reason and you can, that, that can convince you. Yeah, I, I can always be convinced by logic of anything. You, if you show me logic, like I don't, I don't really care how I feel about it. I will eventually agree with it if it is logical. I want to go back a little bit to your um, Exxon internship and how you met each other. Who do I ask questions to? You can ask Rob questions. No. Okay, so what was your impression of Jorge at the time? So I'm going to have to retell part of this story. Um, but the very first time Jorge reached out to me, he's like, do you want to be my roommate? And he sent me a message on Facebook. So I stalked him on his Facebook account before we'd ever met. And what I see on his Facebook is he's posting his grades. Mm-hmm. Right. And at this point, like we're in college, right? We're like juniors. So my initial reaction was, wow, that's this kid is very nerdy or very weird. <laughs> that was my weird take. Accurate, yeah. I was like, cause, and I think your mom was commenting and I know that you had mentioned that you were doing it for your mom, but nonetheless, my interpretation was what? Um, <laughs> and then I don't remember the second time we met, but I do remember at some point we, you were very loud and social right? You tried to be at least, right? You were very much like, yo, I think you were also, okay, what else happened? You were also, you made friends with a lot of people, maybe not like close friends, but like you made friends with a lot of people pretty quickly, I think, right? I remember that for me, I was like, okay, we were talking about girls or something and Hori's like, oh yeah, I talked to her. I talked to her and he like has all the insight, right? He's, <laughs> And he's like, 
And he's like, so this girl, da, 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 and he's like talking about like asking why and like, you know. So I think my initial reaction, there's two memories I have. One, we're at a baseball game. And this is towards the beginning, I think, in like this Astro Stadium in Houston. And I'm sitting next to Jorge and there's like a whole group of people. But for some reason, we're like sitting next to each other and just talking. And um, I remember in that moment, I was like, huh, like this kid is smart. I'm using the word kid, but I was a kid too, right? But I was like, you ask interesting questions. You have a very social perspective. Um, and, and okay, so that was like the first memory. The next time is that he's like on my mini team, I guess. So like, no, 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 for, for at Exxon, like we're in the pipeline group, right? And Jorge would always call me son. He'd be like, what's up, son, or something. And we had this like Asian mentor, not a mentor, but she was like a hiring lead or something. And she's like, you should call him. She She's kind of strange too. But she's like, you should, she told me like, you should call him Moon. So I would like call Jorge Moon. What is Moon? The oh, opposite of we son. did that. Oh. That was a thing for a while. So like we're in like the same team of like six or seven. And I think that at that time, I valued intelligence a lot. And my take was Jorge was the smartest one. So Jorge was the smartest one. Jorge was asking interesting questions. And Jorge was social with a lot of these friends. But at the same time, Jorge was still unaware of how he was perceived by others. And I remember that we were at dinner one time. And it was like six people. And Jorge gets there and just starts talking and just doesn't stop. <laughs> and like... Yeah. I was talking to this girl at the time and she's like, what just happened? <laughs> like while you were still talking. So I think there was a realization at the time that like, okay, you are friends with a lot of people and you are very social, but there's that skill of observation. And um, let's say, you know, being more wide eyed, that's not even a term, but I'm just saying like, instead of being super narrow, you get super engaged and you big talk. So, so there's all these like weird complexities, like, Social, loud, life of the party because of the energy. He had energy. That was another mm -hmm. huge thing. Out of everyone there, right, there's 200 kids there. And Jorge was like, I'm going to do whatever the heck I want. <laughs> and I have energy. And I'm going to talk. And I'm going to do what I want. So it was cool because you could kind of command a crowd in that way. Very smart, asking a lot of questions. But at the same time, you can't let them talk too much or else people will be like, okay, this guy's too annoying. So like, in a way, that was like my experience is kind of like, okay, I want to hang out with Jorge, but like, I, like you can't talk too much <laughs> that was your thing you would just talk so much yeah okay that's my take does that sound accurate or hey or like what do you think about hearing I mean, that you are correct that i was very unaware at the time um and that sounds a lot like me that sounds like something i would do yeah for sure did you realize that that's how people perceived you no clue. No, no idea. I, ha I don't have any, any of that skill. Including um, the transcript? Like the, like the, my grades? Yeah. No, not at all. I thought that was good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, like, there's a little bit of context there, but like, um, no one in my family has gone to college. No one has one has done well academically. So this was like the biggest flex that you could do in my family to Rob is like, who cares? Like, why are you doing that? But to me, I was like, this is good. This is like, I'm, I'm doing well. <laughs> um, now I, now I see like, oh yeah, absolutely ridiculous. But I know how I was thinking at the time and it make, it makes sense that I would have done that. Yeah. Um, so you're on, you said you were at your low. And during this Exxon time, you're on your up and up because you're going to counseling, you're understanding your situation, you're learning. What else helps you get on the up and up? And then also like, now what? Yeah. And I'm not really sure if I would call it being in the up and up. Like, is another thing I didn't realize at the time. Counseling, when just like, when, when you're like in like my situation where you didn't, like you've suppressed a lot of emotions smacks you in the face harder than anything so like suddenly i have like a mental illness suddenly i have issues with my mom i don't even know i had and yeah like i have issues with my wife and i'm not doing well at work like i was just getting just 
I was getting punched while I was down, I felt. Um, and yeah, so I was at rock bottom and then I got dropped lower and just slowly over time, over years, like it just kind of started picking back up. Um, and mainly I think I switched jobs. That was like huge. Like, cause at the time I was feeling like, oh, this is what works like. And I can't, I can't do work like this. This is like crazy. I thought it was going to be as easy as school was. And then I just got smacked in the mouth by Exxon. So I, I, I switched jobs. I'm not, I'm not doing well at Exxon. I don't like it there. And I decided to go try to like pursue my passion. Cause my passion was always like, I want to work for, for space. So I go apply at Boeing where I work now and they were not hiring for any of their space divisions, but they're hiring for commercial airplanes in Seattle. So I get a job there, take a huge pay cut, best pay cut I ever took. Not, not going to lie. It hurt so bad, but changing jobs was like a godsend. This was like a game changer because I went to Boeing and I have like a huge appreciation for Boeing now that I didn't have at the time. Just like you could have a long career, very stable job, chill coworkers, chill job, and you can work on interesting stuff. Um, but yeah, it's like going from Exxon to Boeing, just like the expectations were so much lower. Like the people were so much nicer, like the, just like the work was so much more interesting because I was working on planes instead of pipelines. Um, so yeah, like counseling changed jobs, much better fit. Um, and yeah, so I became a stress engineer in, in Boeing commercial airplanes in Seattle. What percentage was your pay cut? 20%. How much were you making? Ooh, I'm not sure if I want to get into that. Um, but I was, I was making since, since I'm still working and my, my coworkers might see this, I'm just going to say I was making more than six figures at Exxon. And then I'm guessing when you went switch jobs, you had to move as well. And how was that? Um, yeah, the, the move was good, uh, because like, like, since my wife's Japanese, she was really struggling with the heat of Houston. Uh, that's another thing I didn't know. Like Japanese have very sensitive skin, or at least my wife does. And Japanese really, really take care of their skin. Like they walk around with like, um, UV cut umbrellas and UV cut jackets and UV cut like little sleeves that you put over your arms. Like they really, really take care of their skin. And like the, the, the strength of the UV rays in Houston was like destroying her. And also the mosquitoes were living like these giant, like literally like this big welts <laughs> on her leg and she was just getting murdered. So yeah, leaving Houston, like we liked the city. There was a lot to do there, but Going from Houston to Seattle, like she loves Seattle. Expensive as all hell, but man, just night and night and day difference. Like the, the weather was so good. The summers were amazing. Um, yeah. So is Seattle kind of like Japan weather? No, I wouldn't say so. Japan's really humid and Seattle mm -hmm. isn't. And, um, Japan has four seasons and, I'm not sure if Seattle does. Seattle has like gloomy and perfect with us. Gloomy for most of the year and perfect summer. So at some point in here, you decided to do a podcast. How yeah. come? <laughs> um, yeah. So like I, I had, um, I had been an engineer at Boeing for a while and like things were going much better. I'd, I'd done a couple jobs and became a software engineer eventually, mainly because of this guy. Um, and, um, like Rob has uh, had like a huge influence in my life because of his whole like rebuilding phase. Um, and Rob's always been the kind of guy who's like, what I want to do with my life. 
It's not like, what job do I want to get? What company do I want to work for? Those questions are boring for Rob. It's like, if I could design the perfect life, what would that look like? And then how can I do that? That sounds like a very Rob thing. Um, so, so I spent a lot of time around Rob. This kind of started seeping in a little bit. And like, once I was comfortable at Exxon, I mean, at, at Boeing, um, it was more like, okay, well, what do I care about? Like Boeing's Boeing's fine. It's a great place to work. It's a great place to have a family. The pay is decent. Um, the work is interesting enough, but like, if you ask me, is that what you want to do? Like if you had the choice tomorrow to pick any job, is that what you would do? No, no way. Um, so I started, then I started thinking like, if I, if I could design a job, if I could have a job that like is best suited for me, what would that look like? And you guys know, I like to talk. <laughs> So it was like, okay, like, like, what if my job was just talking? What if my job was like, literally, I, I wake up and I talk to like a really interesting person for a couple hours. And that is my job. Like, what would be necessary for that to go down? So I was like, okay, what if I just start a podcast and interview interesting person after interesting person, do it for years, and then eventually... I'll, I'll get some very, very cool, very, very interesting guests like a Lex Friedman or a Joe Rogan or something like that. Joe Rogan just shows up to work. He interviews a really cool person and goes home and that's it makes millions. I'm not saying I'm going to be the next Joe Rogan, but I'm like, that seems cool. That seems cool to do. Um, so I decided I'm going to do a podcast. I bought all the equipment. I bought this mic and I bought this stand and like bought these lights and I bought everything. And then I got terrified <laughs> because I, yeah, I, I can say some very controversial things. I don't think my takes are that controversial, but I think society would disagree with me. Um, so, and especially with like cancel culture going nice and strong right now, I felt like I'm going to say something that's going to piss off somebody. And then like my son's going to be getting death threats and I'm going to have to change some schools and I'm going to have to move out of my house. And like, it's just going to be bad. Like I was like, if that is the end game, if that is what success looks like, like if I, if I get the millions of views, if I get the millions of subscribers and that is my life now, like I need security. Like, did I win anything? Like would I just want my life that I have now back. That's what I was thinking. So I was like, ah, is it really worth it? Like, do I really want to go through all this pain and struggle and editing and equipment and technical issues and all this? Do I really want to do that if that could potentially be like winning? Uh, cause I don't care that much about money. Um, so I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm fine. My, my, my life is okay right now. I don't need to make the podcast. And then you guys call me and you're like, let's make a podcast. And I was like, I already have all the equipment. So let's go. <laughs> um and yeah it's like you yeah i'm really i'm really thankful for you guys because like i really wanted to do this and you guys like made it happen and we're doing it and i'm really happy about that what will take us to the next level i think we have to be very aggressive in our strategy and very good in our quality so i think like every podcast needs great audio quality, great video quality. Like, I think we need to get better on camera. We need to get better in our interviewing skills. We need to get better in our questioning. We need to be able to get better guests. So we have to like networking outside. We have to really, really understand the YouTube algorithm and or the Spotify algorithm. We have to really, really understand like every single piece that goes into making a successful business in, in content creation. And I think we're all pretty like how our minds work we're very good at problem solving stuff like that maybe we don't have like the, the natural content creator skills that a lot of people have but like problem solving we got so i think we just prov pro solve the first problem and solve the next problem and solve the one after that and just keep solving problems until we get there what's our respective role What's up? Are we are are we all problem solvers or are we each do we each have a special role? I actually I think this works really well because we have different skill sets. So I would say you, Selena, you are what I would describe the content creator. 
you are you you put out a ton of content and you just do it like it's no problem like i would think a lot more before i put something out there you just put it out there you just create content you do it you get the editing done you just you do it rob is like i would say the operator the the pusher i don't know how to describe this cuz like i might say like okay let's let's do this for like the next year and see what's up and rob will be like Okay, that's not fast enough. What what do we need to do to get this launched in like the next month? Like what would need to happen? What do I need to buy? Like who do I need to talk to? What do I need to be friends with? What needs to go down for that to happen in a month? And then Rob will pose that question to me and I will use like my years and years of YouTube knowledge to be like, okay, I think that would look like X. And Rob's like, okay, we're doing X. And then dramatic change will happen after that. Or I will just do this for like a year and be perfectly content. Rob pushes the envelope. He's like, "Nope, we're not doing that. We're doing eight interviews a day until we freaking launch this thing." And I'm like, I have the YouTube algorithm in my head, I guess, just by years and years of binging. <laughs> So like, I think I'm a good person to pitch ideas off of, get a good feel for like, this is good. This is bad. That's a bad idea. That's a good idea. So I think it's actually like a really good trio. If we, if we bring one more person on, what should that person be like? For the podcast or for like the team? For, hmm. Because I feel like the podcast already has a lot of people. Like the interviewing would get kind of hard with more than three. Imagine people. going in with a five people group and we just I mean, tackle I think that, one that person. That just gets too chaotic. We're gonna have like those whatever <laughs> interviews, um, like from the whatever podcasts. But I I think for the podcast, I think three is kind of the limit. Um, but bringing someone to the team, like we could always use a marketing person, like a Ryan. Yeah. Yeah, Ryan Ryan's an actually a very good marketer, yeah. That'd, that'd be good. He could sell anything. He could sell you your own clothes back to you. 